Oh boy, today's episode, we talked to one of the best personal trainers out there, Jordan Syatt. This guy, first off, incredibly strong for his size, actually remarkably, strangely strong for his size, but also a very successful personal trainer. I mean, he's built a successful business, so he talks about how to do that, but he's also successful because his clients get incredible, long-lasting, sustainable Result. Really, when it comes to fitness, he, he revolutionized my entire thinking around this. The insight that he gives is exceptional. Personal trainers, as you know, are the lifeblood of the fitness industry and great personal trainers. They're the wise people. These are the people you want to listen to, and Jordan Syatt is among the best. So we know you're going to love this episode. Now, we're running a sale right now on some workout programs before we get going. Map Symmetry is half off, and the RGB bundle is half off. You can find both if you click on the link at the top of the description below. Also, if you want to be able to win those programs for free, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Um, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And then we will let the winner know that they won in the comment section. All right, here comes the show. Jordan, so it's uh, it's been a long time since yeah. we saw you. Almost I didn't four, realize it was almost, almost four, four years. years. Yeah, it's like four years. All right, catch us up. What's happened since then? What's happened with your business, personal life? Oh, man. Well... I'll say this. I'll start by saying it's great to be back. Awesome. The studio looks amazing. Thank I also you. want to say a huge thank you to all of you because I've seen a number of times you guys shout me out pretty frequently yeah. and you always have really nice things to say and it means the world to me and I appreciate you very much. It, I really, from the bottom of my heart. So thank you for having me out again. Thank you for all the kind words. Thank, thank you. you. You got great content, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're always doing a good One job. One of our goals is, uh, it was to always has been and still is, is to try to highlight the good voices in mm. the space because there's so much bad stuff. Yeah. And um, the only way to beat it is with people who've got great information, who communicate it well. You're one of those people. So Thank anytime you. we get the opportunity, mm -hmm. we'll make sure we, we mention get, it for sure. I get people messaging me like, hey, you got a shout out on Mind Pump today. And like, <laughs> it just, it means a lot. So Very thank cool. you. And I think you guys are amazing. You're the best in the industry for a reason. So we got to slow it down or else people are going to think it's paid or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks Paying for coming on, dude. Say that all the time. <laughs> no, no, really. We really like it. Yeah, uh, but you're just a content machine though. I mean, you're constantly putting out, you've, uh, I mean, I know like you've got the, the Gary V model early even before a lot of people in the fitness space. So you've been pumping out good content for a, a long time. Man. I'm tired, man. I, it, it <laughs> yeah. You seem like you slowed down though. Ever since the kid, you slowed down. You yes, a, yeah. a lot. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's just, it's not as important yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's way more important to have lunch with my daughter and my wife. Yeah. Like where instead of just sitting down and making a piece of content, like, I want to sit there and see if she's going to eat avocado. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. can I watch her face as like, she, she doesn't like avocado right now. So yeah, she has yeah. like scrunchy face. Like it's the priorities change. And it's those little moments where it's like, I would rather sit down with them than make content. So yeah. have any of your, um, approaches or opinions or ideas changed uh, around fitness and health and nutrition since having a child? Has mm. that changed anything for you? Cause I, I did for me for a few different things. Um, you know, my own personal approach for sure, especially from the perspective of just, I don't have as much time, right? Like before I had all the time in the world to train and I only have one kid, never mind people who have multiple kids and, and I can work from home. And so never mind multiple kids and you're working out, you got to commute to work. So for me personally, my approach has just been like getting it in spurts throughout the day. Oftentimes, like sometimes I've a grease the groove approach in some ways with my strength, um, with my, with my cardio, it's also a grease the groove in the perspective of it's not just at one point in time. Like I'll, I'll intersperse it throughout the day. Um, so my own personal approach has just been, I don't need to have one long session, but otherwise, like it's not that I ever didn't agree with that. It's just, I didn't need to do that right. before. So my own schedule has changed. Yeah. Have you, do you, cause I remember this when I had kids, it's like, I became hyper aware of how I knew this before, but not, I wasn't nearly as aware as I was after I became a father of that. Uh, the default, if you just live a normal life, the default is such poor health. And I became super aware of it because now mm. I've got these people that I'm so, yeah. you know, I love so much and I care about so much. How do you approach that? She's only, your daughter's what, one? She just turned one, yeah. Yeah, so are you thinking about that? Like, how do I prepare this person for this world where if she doesn't live in a strange, different way, she's going to be unhealthy? I think about it constantly, probably to a fault. Like, it's nonstop in my head. Um, I think about it from the perspective of I want to live as long as I can to be here for her and mm -hmm. make sure that she's prepared. So, I mean, I think about it from the perspective of, like, we're getting jujitsu mats in our house so that like she can defend herself. And like, from oh, like cool. I it's, it's one of those things. Like when I started jujitsu, 
there's a girl at the academy I train at. She's 16. Her name's Vanessa. If, and I'm, I'm not saying this, like I have 10 year wrestling background, high level power lifter, like strong guy. I've done jujitsu now for like four years. I'm not making this up that this girl, if her and I actually got into a combat situation, she would fucking destroy me. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's, and she's never lifted a weight in her life. And so mm. for me, it's, yes, I want my daughter to strength train and I want her to be healthy. And, and there's so many things to balance there, but it's also thinking from the perspective of, I want her to be able to defend herself, which is like so many other aspects come into play there. So I think about it all the time from a nutrition perspective, from like a mental health perspective, and I'm sort of all over the place with it. Like I, I'm like constantly trying to figure things out, watching her. How am I speaking about this food? How am I speaking about exercise? She's just... I've, my wife and I, like within the last 72 hours have realized that she's watching us and she's only one, yeah. like she's doing for, this is what happened. She picked up the TV. She can't walk yet. So like she can crawl and she can like cruise, like holding on to things. She picked up the TV remote and pointed it at the TV. Yeah. I was Oops. like, that is wild <laughs> yeah, yeah. to me. I was like, that she knows that's what we do. We take the remote. She doesn't know just we push the button. She just yeah. picked it up and pointed at it. And I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. So with the fact that she's already watching and understanding, like t being aware of what am I putting in my mouth? What food am I eating? Is she watching me exercise? Is she watching me get up early and go on a walk? Like she's watching. So just that has changed my entire idea of my daily habits matter a lot. It's funny you say that because one of the most common questions I get asked is, you know, for advice for new parents. And the thing that I say the most consistently is you have to become hyper aware that they are downloading everything that you do. Do not think for a minute that because that kid can't speak to you mm -hmm. and articulate the want. In fact, I have this belief that because they can't talk, that all their other senses are heightened. Yeah. So they are just processing all this stuff that they're trying to figure it out and they, and they can't communicate. And so they listen, they see really what they, and they're just downloading and sucking up all the information. So, you know, when you're talking to your wife, you know, be aware of how you talk and communicate in front of her, be, be aware of the habits that you do in front. Like they are like little sponges and you are already starting to, you know, create that foundation and that mainframe Bro, of how they're going to operate. You don't, you don't know how intuitive you are. The, 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 the data that they show now is because, so children, their job is to be hyper aware of mm. the environment, the mood, and everything about their parents because you're the caretaker. So that's literally what they do better than anything. They notice everything. Even if they can't uh, verbalize it and process it, their bodies react and their brains mold themselves. Makes around so it. much sense. I know. So Ka crazy. Katrina and I had a situation when, when Max was around one year, one years old where, and we were, you know, at that point we were talking about like how, how blessed we are that he was this good behaving kid and he doesn't act out. He doesn't throw things and doing this stuff like that. And we were actually talking, she works for the company. So we're talking about the business one day. It's like in the later afternoon, it's like after dinner and he's, he's kind of sitting down doing something and, she is her and I are talking and we're like, we're disagreeing about something with work. And I'm like, no, 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 I want it this way. We're not even like, we're not yelling, but we are like going back and forth. Like, and that is the only time he had, that was the first time at that point that he had ever experienced anything like that. And I actually watched him go to the coffee table and swipe the stuff off. And that was like the first time he'd ever done something similar. Wow. What was so great though, was that it got both of our, we both turned and looked and then we looked at each other and he goes, oh, wow. He thinks like we're fighting right now. And so then we went right over to him to play with him. So that, but it just made us aware. Like, I'm like, wow, how often does that happen to a couple, especially when they're really fighting? It was luckily we're just talking business. It was very easy for us to stop that moment and realize like, wow, that's how, how much that can affect him and his behavior is he doesn't recognize what's going on behind between mom and dad. They've never communicated this way before. And he acts out and it's like, whoa, like how often does that happen in households where you're so into this argument or fight with your spouse and your kid is an earshot away and he's trying to get your attention and you just ignore it. Cause of course you're in the middle of this fight. Like mm -hmm. that was a big moment for us to be like, damn, they're way more aware than I think people realize. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, especially, especially like how you speak to your yeah. partner. Cause you're essentially showing them like what to expect in their own partner in the future and their friends and all of that. Jordan Peterson had a great, 
a great bit that I saw. Basically, he was he was answering the question of, is it okay to argue in front of your children? He was like, it's, it's not the question of, is it okay to argue? The question is, number one, like how you speak to each other, but also did you reconcile? That's it. Yeah. Mm. It's the, it's the re- and I, I think it's equally important in terms of how you're arguing, but also if you show that you can reconcile after an argument, it's such an important thing because so many, so many relationships end, so many people have explosions just because they can't reconcile. Yeah. So it's like, I think that's, it's so important, especially even before they can talk, like you said, it's yeah. super interesting. Well, they're getting ready for the world. So they're going to go through that. And it's like, oh, this is how it is. You reconcile mm-hmm. afterwards. You repair. Yeah. Not like, eh, I'm done. Fight out of here. Right. Type right. of deal. So yeah, it's crazy stuff. What about your, how's your business changed? Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely grown. I mean, you're constantly growing. <laughs> yeah. You're doing a great job. How, what's happened over the last uh, few years that's uh, so, changed with that? So thank God it's going really well. So I, last time I was here, I, I had my inner circle, which yep. is like my membership mm-hmm. for fitness. Uh, I have also created a membership for coaches with my buddy, Mike Vacanti. Oh, cool. Um, okay. So he's actually coaching Gary. He He's Gary's coach. Um, but we have a basically bombarded with ads from all these gurus, like, like six figure businesses, da, yeah. da, 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 yeah. like high ticket. None, and we're just like, fuck this. Like, it's so annoying. Yeah. So we basically made another affordable option for coaches to learn how to, you know, be good coaches. It's not just about, we don't talk about ads. We don't talk about any of that stuff. It's literally like, how do you program design? Mm. How do you do nutrition coaching? How do you understand behavior change? Uh, we have bits on like social media and all of that, but the majority of it is, how to be a good coach. Do, do you think, I, so I was thinking about this the other day, uh, cause it wasn't like this before. I didn't, I never saw, I've been doing this for a long time. I never saw ads for companies te- that advertise coaching or training as a way to make a lot of money that didn't mm-hmm. exist before. Yeah. And most trainers that I know who got into the business back then or coaches, they didn't do it because they want to make a lot of money. They do right. it because of the passion exactly. for helping people. In fact, when I was a general manager, one of the hardest things I ever did was to teach them that, yeah, you have to learn how to sell. And they're like, I don't want to sell. I just want to help people. Like, well, you're not going to be able to help anybody. <laughs> yeah. You got to survive. You exactly, can't sell. Yeah. Do you think that this, the, the, uh, like this push now, well, this is how you can make a lot of money, is starting to bring in coaches and trainers who might not have the same passion because 100%. they look at it and they're like, oh, I like to work out and it's a great way to make money. So 100%. Just, yeah. I, I Absolutely that. I think what's happened is, and there's so many different facets, but I think on I'm, when I first got into online coaching, so I started online co- like my online business in 2011, and before I knew an online business was possible, I was just doing it because I saw Eric Cressy and Dan John and Joel Jamieson and Mike Roberts and all these people making content. And I was like, okay, I'll open my gym one day, but they have a website, so I'll do the same thing. And I think now online coaching is it's very common, yeah. it's mm-hmm. super common, and I think people are hiring an online coach and they're getting results. And they're like, I could do that. And so they're like, they see that they worked with an online coach. They got their macros, they got their workout. And they're like, Oh, I can do this. And then they don't know about program design. They don't know about individuality. They don't know about any of this stuff. And so like, I remember I had uh, one woman reach out and she was like, she was 22. She was like, I'm getting really bored of writing programs. I was like, you're 22. You're getting <laughs> bored of writing programs. And I asked, I was like, how oh, many no. books on program design have you read? And she was, she goes, books? And I was like, yeah, books <laughs> on program design, not like Instagram reels <laughs> or like how many books have you read on it? She was like, none. So I gave oh, her a wow. big lesson to her credit. She's crushed it and she's doing great now. But I think a lot of people are coming into it because they got coached once or twice and then think, oh, this will be a great business for me, mm-hmm. not because they love coaching, but because they got results and they think it's going to be easy to do the same mm-hmm. thing. You know, what this yeah. reminds me of in the late nineties, early two thousands, a franchise moved into the gym space called curves Yeah, and they became the number one franchise very quickly. And what it was is for people don't know, it was like a circle of pneumatic equipment, very sh- small studio. It was advertised just the women. They exploded because they were tapping into a segment of the market that the gyms weren't able to tap into. But then what happened was people saw that they made a lot of money very quickly. Members in particular who followed Curse for six months. Oh my gosh, great. I'm going to open one myself. Yes. And you had this explosion and then this crash because fitness, in my opinion, has to be led by people with a deep passion for fitness. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it won't work. Do you think the coaching space is going to go through that where you're having this huge influx of people 
And a lot of them are going to be like, oh, wait, this isn't working because I just want to do this for money. And it's actually a lot harder than I thought. Yeah, I think I think it's happening. We're just not acutely aware of it. Okay. Like I, I can't begin to tell you, like, there have been so many people who've started and then stopped. I've seen yeah. it over and over and over again. They've, I'm going to start a business and then stop. And I think there's just the ease of access yeah. is, is it's easier now than ever before. So there's always new people coming in. We don't see the drop like we would in curves because yeah. it's not in person. It's not like a, a brick and mortar business. We also don't have those numbers. Like they had franchise numbers. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. I think here it's just people are joining Instagram or people are starting their fitness page and they post for two days and they don't get a client and then they stop. And then they start like, I don't know why I didn't get a client. I look at their page. It's like, well, you post a picture of your pickup truck. Like, of course you didn't get a fucking client. <laughs> and you posted like two pictures. It's like, so, so I just, th I think it's happening all the time. So the churn rate is huge. It's just, it's, we're not going to see it as in like one big spike yeah. and then one big drop. I just think it's happening all the time. Do you, do you, do you think yeah. it's possible to uh, be a good coach and go directly into online coaching first? Or do you think that it requires in person first? What's your thought on that? I'm, this is going to be an mm -hmm. unpopular opinion, but I think if you haven't coached people in person at all, then you can't be that's, the best yeah, coach. That's, what we've like, that's exactly what we've said that forever. Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand. Um, There's too much nuance um, that you learn yeah. through the process of, because you could take, this is the part that's that's so unique, is that you could take literally 10 people, same age, same goal, same issue, same everything, and yet you, you the programming, the diet, the, everything could be completely different. Yes. And then even then break it down even further, distill it to uh, the cues exactly. for the exercises. Yes. All 10 will be unique on how you have to communicate all three of those major parts of being successful. That's really hard to kind of figure out just getting dropped into the internet world where you don't get to practice that and figure that in person. So. I've always seen a deficit for real like movement coaches too. It's always been like, it kind of made sense for me from an aesthetic perspective to like, you know, you do your pictures, you do macros and you're able to kind of coach them nutritionally, but actually like good coaching and being able to see a lot of those nuances in their movement, it's really difficult to do uh, via video. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I know, I know too, like from uh, a lot of these people too, I, I think might be part of the problem is that they get in this transformation and they look great and they post about it. They get so much attention. Everybody's like hitting them up. They're like, can you tell me what you did? Can yes. you coach me on this? Are you finding that as like um, a commonality that you see with, with new coaches in the space coming in is that they were just asked to do it a hundred all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's like, Oh, you look really good. Yeah. Like, People ask me like, like I'm I'm doing a cut right now, and people are like, "What are your calories? What are you eating?" <laughs> like it matters, right? And I'm like, like it that is for them. irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. N I'm talking about the principles of what you need to do. Yeah. Stop asking like, and people are like, "Can you do it? Oh, what I eat in a day? Uh, Never." Yeah, it's our total. It's, it's I our fucking pee, bro. hate it's that same. content. You know that's you know it's crazy though, and yeah. I bet you have the same mm -hmm. experience. That gets the most, the most, views. the most. If I post my food for the day, yeah, and I tell people with it, and so it's like, but you guys don't understand. Like, it doesn't matter what yeah. I'm doing. It doesn't matter. Even if I you have the same goal and you go the same way, like, workout. Yeah, it's not going to necessarily <laughs> work for you, you know. And, and even if it does, it doesn't mean you have the answers. You right. Know what I'm and and when I post something, like if I'm going to have something, I post it. If I post something, people are like, but why? I'm like, because I fucking want it. Like, it doesn't <laughs> yeah. need, like, everything doesn't need, like, okay, well, the free radicals are going to be, like, a po <laughs> like it's just, the, I don't know, there's protein and carbs, and, like, there's fiber. That's really what I wanted in this meal, and there are a million different options, and this is what I had available today. Yeah. You've been doing this a long yeah. time like us. Do you feel like we have made it more difficult and overcomplicated it for the average person? Yes. It's totally, huh? so much, so much. And it's, yeah, unfortunately. And, and I think it's, when I was coming up, it was very difficult to get information. And right. I say very is in quotes because before me, it was even more difficult. Yeah, like right. there were barriers. There were barriers. Like you had to go to the library and you had to take out a book. And if you wanted access to peer reviewed papers, like you had to either be at a university or pay for it. Or uh, now it's like that I go on Instagram and there's nonstop information mm -hmm. and people will send me screen recordings or screenshots of like me saying it's okay to have an apple. And then the next video down is some motherfucker being like, don't have an apple. And the, so, but, and the, both people are giving scientific reasoning right. for it. So it's very confusing. Yeah. And this, it now it's, it's the excess information that is making it way more overcomplicated. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So I, I, there's two points I want to make is the first one is, personal training or coaching in person is one of those few jobs where it's like baseball, where if you bat 
300, you're doing a good job. Like if 30% yes. of your clients achieve permanent success, yep. you're crushing it's it a great analogy. as a trainer. Now you want to coach people online and never meet them in person and work with them. You've just, you, it's exponentially more challenging to do so. Yep. So we've always said, if you want to be a good online coach, you got to do it in person because yes. you're only making it that much more challenging. You haven't figured it out yeah. in person. You're not going to be able to figure it out uh, online. Yeah. So, and that's, that's most important. The second comment I want to make is you, you said there's too much information. Here's a big problem I see. And I would love your commentary on this is that our space gets so caught up in the who's more right. Um, tribalism. The study said this. No, but my experience says this. No, mm -hmm. but for bodybuilding, it's this. No, but strength athletes and coaches do this. And no, it's that the average person isn't hearing the basics that they need to apply. What yeah. they hear is all this insanity. And they're like, okay, well, he said coffee's good, but then they said my adrenals <laughs> aren't good. And then fasting in this study showed it was great, but they said it's not good for my cortisol. And then this guy says eat, you know, carnivore because it's good for, you know, autoimmune issues. But then this guy brought up studies says it's connected to, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing anything at all. Too hard. I, yeah. feel, I feel like we're too scattered and 100%. we're not all working together. Yes. That's how I feel. You feel okay. Uh -huh. And, it, you know, it's so funny. <laughs> the studies thing is very interesting to me. Yeah. Because before, the only people who had access to studies were people who like had some semblance of knowledge and some like, knew how to find studies. Even then, though, that there you were still able to cherry pick. I've been playing with Chat GPT, and I can go on. I'd be like, "Hey, are, is there a study showing X, Y, or Z?" <laughs> yes, and I'd be like, "Yes, you can like, find can a study to prove." Any link point. me to that study, yeah, yeah. and it will send me the PubMed link yeah. on both sides. On both sides, yeah. so now anybody can say, "Well, here's yeah. a study saying this," and it's like. Now you have to actually go in and you have to actually read the study and explain the issues, but they're not going to fucking listen. No. It's yeah, it's people are it's and there are some really great, there's some great content around it. I've seen some people make content where you've got, I don't know, someone being like, all right, never eat, never eat fruits or vegetables. And they're like, they're about to eat an apple. And then they're like, all right, well, I'll yeah, throw the apple away. my favorite little it, where they, it's like, yeah. they go through like five things in the day and then they end up eating ice cubes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's true. It's, yeah. it's cause no matter what, there's going to be someone like, you should never have this. You should never have that. It's yeah. It's one are, of the things that actually really pisses me off that people do. I actually will kind of get after somebody who does this is it's you'll, we have so much content. We have so many friends in the space that are putting out good content that there's going to you're going to find something that we communicate differently. And mm -hmm. I hate when someone will take like a piece of your content, DM me and be like, oh, well, yeah. what do you think about this? Cause <laughs> yeah. it's, the worst. it's just like, you were looking at the wrong thing. Like yeah. there's what he's saying is right, but you you're focusing on like one aspect of how we're both communicating and he's communicating them totally different for right. a different situation. And so are we, it's like Correct. both people are right yeah. or both people are wrong. However you want to well, look at it. It's I'm like, going to give you a great example. Did you watch, yeah. I watched a couple episodes of that. Um, there's a series now on Netflix. Uh, what was it called? The blue zone one yeah it was about like 100 to, years that's yeah it's like how to live a long time I remember seen, it's, it's actually called. really good i haven't seen, seen it it's no, really good right okay. so what they're doing is they're going through the world's blue zones which yep. by the way there's some uh controversy around that even but whatever they, they definitely people definitely do live longer in a lot of these areas like and as they're Greece, japan yeah so like sardinia yeah, okay. okinawa, okinawa yeah, you yeah, know yeah. uh loma linda the seventh day Adventists. <laughs> and he's going through and he's highlighting the, the the way that these people live in each area and what may be playing a role and why they live so long but even the way they communicate it is confusing. For example, in Sardinia, this is an island off the coast of Italy, they found the highest concentration of centurions was strongly related to the altitude of the town that they lived in. And so people are going to get confused about that. Reality, what it is, is people are walking up a lot of stairs. Right. Right? Yeah, exactly. Every day to <laughs> yeah, go yeah, home yeah. and to go to the grocery store. We got to move. Right. <laughs> then they were showing other stuff. And they're like, oh, they eat yeah. this food and it's very high Everybody's in antioxidants. And but, oh, but in Okinawa, they eat this other thing <laughs> that's really got all these you know, fights for radicals and it's got all this fiber and all this stuff. But the commonality, here's what they're not commun communicating. They all don't eat processed food. Yeah. No. That's that's Correct. pretty much kind of what it boils down to. Um, what are some of the most important basic things you like to communicate to people to kind of simplify the whole damn thing? Yeah, I mean, so walk, yeah, movement is number one. Uh, sleep is number two. Uh, strength training. Yeah. I, mean, I know this is all crazy shit. Like, <laughs> I, I also yeah, like blood. I actually tell people now more than ever. I'm like, stop watching the news. Like, yeah, oh, I think it's like one of the most important things right uh, now. That's actually for, a really cool one to but, keep in the top five of like, this is like for health, for yeah. mental health. Yeah. And, and I, it's not even just mental. I, so I, 
I like tracking my blood pressure. Uh, it's been a big thing for oh, me. You're doing and, that thing right now. That's actually really cool. And, and so I've, I've tested on myself weeks where I watch the news and weeks where I don't. And my blood pressure is significantly higher on weeks when I watch the news versus when I don't, wow. which is like, that's no joke. Wow. You're chronically elevated blood pressure versus chronically healthy blood pressure just from the only change, not my diet, not exercise, not just sleep, that. just news. Wow. It's like, I have no doubt that people who are just sit down watching CNN, Fox, whatever it is all day, their blood pressure is higher and they're more likely to have a heart attack, stroke, any of that stuff. Here's wow. a question. It obviously makes people feel crappy. I think people know that. Like mm -hmm. right now, people listening are like, yeah, totally. I can understand that. Why do <laughs> yeah. we do it? Why do people keep doing it? it it's, there's, that's a great question. I've, the, the number one, this pisses me off so much. The number one uh, issue that, people have when I say that. And it's not common. I'd say like maybe 3% of people will say it. Like it's a very privileged thing for you to say. Oh God. Meanwhile, I'm like, all right, well, you're saying my, my go-to comment is like, well, you are replying on your smartphone that like, I have a very privileged point of view is very privileged of you. And then I'll be like, do you see how that doesn't help the situation? <laughs> Just saying something is privileged doesn't actually accomplish anything. It's like, if you're in a situation where you have a smartphone and you can talk to me the, through the internet, you're also very privileged, <laughs> yeah. but doesn't accomplish any, like help us get to the bottom of the point to the thing we're trying to discuss. So I think people will do it because they, they feel like either if they don't watch it, then they're going to they're going to be like getting hurt. There's going to be a serious issue if they don't watch it, or they feel and I this I haven't voiced this, but I think they feel some level of virtuousness from watching it. Yeah. Are and you then, informed? Yeah, I'm informed. Exactly. Yeah. And Denzel Washington's amazing quote: "Like if you if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. But if you do watch the news, you're misinformed. Yeah, it's I just like it's super smart, and and I think they feel like okay, well, I'm informed on these issues, so I feel better about myself. It's like, but what are you doing about yeah. it? You you know what it is? What we're fighting? I think this is a general statement that covers a lot. What we're fighting is uh, primitive, yeah. for lack of a better term, um, behaviors and the way we evolved in a in an environment that completely doesn't match. So in other words. If you're in a tribe, which we were for hundreds of thousands of years, just recently we moved out of that, right? Uh, in terms of the, the time modern humans have been on earth. If you're in a tribe, you are going to be attracted to bad news because you have to. It's like, it would be mm -hmm. like bad news you got from your neighbors. Like your neighbors come to you and like, hey dude, there's a bear yeah. in the neighborhood. Or there's a guy breaking into houses. Yeah, yeah, right. you right. have to know. Right. So you're attracted to it. <clears throat> The problem is that has expanded to the world. Yeah. And there's always crazy shit happening in the world because it's billions of people. This is a numbers game. Yes. Yeah. Just like, uh, you know, uh, how we're, we've made life easy for us physically because that used to be bad for us. We used mm -hmm. to get hurt. It was backbreaking labor. It really did damage us because it just was horrible. And then we went so far in the other direction now where we you have to schedule movement. Otherwise, you're going to die. <laughs> Same thing with food also. So it's literally like we have to navigate what we've done to the world in a way that benefits our – you have to be aware, basically, of our behaviors. Right. That's why I think we're attracted. One of the reasons why we're attracted to bad news is yeah. we're, we've evolved. Yeah to watch and listen to bad news. It's addictive too. Yeah. Like I'll notice myself just being like, continue the death scroll on social media. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I don't need to know about this awful thing that happened. Like seven countries, like I don't need to know this. Like that that one family, like it sucks. But I keep seeing all these terrible things pop up and it's it's addictive to get sucked into it. And then you feel terrible, makes your day worse. Like it's, it's bad. How yeah. was that transition for you? Like that was another thing that changed for me when, once I became a father was I became hyper aware of my own patterns on the phone and stuff mm -hmm. like that because now i know this kid is watching me and just like yeah. you said will emulate what i'm doing already even at one like have you noticed a difference in your own behavior are there things that you've put in as far as practices to like i don't want to i don't want her to see me on the phone or are you doing anything different than you were before yeah so it's not that i don't want her to see me on the phone because like that number one that's impossible and number yeah. two like she's going to use a phone right uh for me it's more just when i'm with her yeah I am not looking at my phone while I'm with her in terms of like, if I'm having a conversation with her, like as much as we can, or if we're playing, I'm not also on my phone. Yeah, It's I'm with you and you matter. And this conversation or this moment is between us, not us. And then also me interacting with other mm -hmm. people. Yeah. That for me is the number one thing where, um, for what I would do. One thing I didn't like when I was a kid is, is, uh, if my dad was on the phone when we were in the car, like we'd get in the car immediately, he'd call a friend. 
And so like there wasn't much communication. So that will be something for me is when we're in the car, we'll use that as time to talk. I don't want to get one of those cars with the TVs in the back of the, in the seats because mm-hmm. like I want to have a conversation. So with the phone, especially, it's, it's not that I can't use it when, or she shouldn't see me. It's just when I'm talking with you, uh, it's just you. Yeah. And and that's yeah. it. I had an experience like that where my son was playing. I'm like, oh, he's playing over there. I'll be on my phone. And then I looked up and I noticed that every once in a while, he'd look up to chat. Mm. Oh, crush me. Yeah. My heart. yeah. <laughs> so now I'm trying to be, you know, I try to be more aware. You know, um, what's interesting when we talk about um, all these different issues, I mean, look, uh, for all intents and purposes, chronic health issues seem to be getting worse. Yes. Um, people are, obesity has gone up. Yep. Um, you know, cancer rates, although we figured out how to, work with cancers to an extent. Once we get them, we're still getting them at higher rates. Dementia and Alzheimer's going up. Mental illness has mm-hmm. exploded. Mm-hmm. Basically all chronic health issues have gotten uh, worse. Yep. And we figured out how to band-aid them or maybe treat some of them a little better with modern medicine, but it, they're still getting worse. Meanwhile, the fitness industry simultaneously has grown, mm-hmm. has made more money, has sold more products. More people are aware of I guess, exercise and diet than ever. What are we doing wrong? What the hell? Why are we failing? Because I think for, I think of all markets, we have the answers. We actually do. If you scoured every market, the one that actually has the best answers for all these problems is is our space. Where are we going wrong? Why why, Why are people getting worse while we continue to grow? Man, it's a great question. There's like so many different things going through my mind. I'll talk about something that stuck out to me so I have family in Israel. We go to Israel at least a couple times a year. And one thing about whenever I go to another country, whether it's Israel or somewhere in the UK, or whatever it is, it's never as convenient as the United States is. And the United States, is it's amazing. It's incredible, partly because it's so convenient. There's so much uh, innovation, but you can get anything delivered to your door immediately. You don't really have to get out. Like it, and when we go to Israel, there's so much more of a focus on family. There's a focus on movement. There's a focus on like, there are things now where you can order it and d- deliver it directly to your door. But most people, they value getting up, moving, going somewhere, spending the day at the beach. It, it's much more about about living as opposed to trying to reduce the time spent doing something else so you can sit on your couch more. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think if if I'm really thinking about from a lifestyle perspective, I just think things have gotten so easy for us that it's like people always want like, what what I want to do less, I want to do less, I want to do less. I think it's more of a mindset. And there are some really amazing coaches who are putting out, I mean, look at the the popularization of David Goggins, like just go hard, be hard. Like this, it's, I think we're craving it, but so many people are just, are, stuck and feel, and feel stuck in that like they, everything is convenient so that it's more difficult to move. You just hit on my theory on why we've seen in the last decade, OCR explode Spartan mm, and yeah. all those, because I think deep down we crave that and we need that. Yes. And we don't even, cause if you think about it for a second, like how ridiculous that is that you pay money to a place to go crawl through mud, get in freezing water, you know what I'm saying? Get Jump beat up. burning hoops. Yes. <laughs> like you I'm actually, alive. you pay to do that. Like <laughs> imagine being, you know, 300 years ago, somebody like you know, time traveling and coming in and like, wait, wait, these people are all paying for this. Yes. Like, but it's like, that's how we've gotten so far from that, yeah. removed from that, that there, you know, be interesting because you make that point about other countries. And I, I feel the same way. Like when you go to Europe, like when you eat out, it's like a four hour process. Yes. Like, even the waiters and waitresses, they don't like, they don't even serve you the same way. Like if you're an American and you go somewhere like that, like you have to learn to like be okay with like your waiter might not come by for another like yes, 30 minutes. You know exactly. Well, here they bring you the five bill hours. With the food. Yeah. yeah. They're like, they're trying to pump, they're trying to pump you out to get to the next table. I feel like and they make it, the seats uncomfortable. So oh, you leave it's, faster. It's so like, light. So yeah. it'd be interesting to see <clears throat> if that aligns with my, my flaw or my theory on the OCR, if there's like a higher enrollment here in America, because we're so far away from that, well, maybe a lower role. What you guys are places. talking about is a culture, and yes. I agree with that. But how yeah. the hell do you change a culture? <clears throat> you know, I want to ask you, uh, because you communicate um, health and fitness appropriately and effectively, that's a very tough combination. It's hard to sell the right thing the right way and be effective because mm. you're constantly countering the easier, faster, take this pill, flashy type of message. Yeah. How have you found success? And the reason why I want you to answer this is because we have coaches and trainers listening right now. Yeah. And I know they're tempted to build their business. What appears to be the easy way. Yeah. And 
what you are doing appears to be the hard way, but yet here you are extremely successful. Mm -hmm. I, like communicate that. How did you do that? Selling these ideas the right way. And, and why wouldn't you want to sell it the wrong way? So um, there are many reasons why you don't want to sell it the wrong way. Like your soul being one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but like what I, for me lately, I like to look at comments that I get on, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, whatever podcast and look for common trends. And the, the most common trend that I've really enjoyed seeing in the last few years is I appreciate how real you are. And it's the word real. And I think that it's more common now for people to be lied to mm. and for people to, uh, to be sold something fake and, and not even just a product, but the personality, who they are is yeah. fake. Yeah. And I think by being like being just honest and saying and being who you are and being truthful, you automatically stand out. <laughs> yeah. which is it, it's bizarre. it's unique now it's bizarre nowadays like oh that person is actually telling me the truth yeah. in a very vulnerable <clears throat> honest authentic way and i the word authentic is so thrown around now it's, yeah. it's it become inauthentic now to use it but it i very much believe like one thing i've worked on very very hard is doing my absolute best to say just be honest just say the truth, no matter what. And Jordan Peterson has been a huge influence yeah. on me for this. It's like, if you can just be about how you feel, what you're thinking, what you're going through, you automatically stand out uh, just, just by telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to mm -hmm. add a chair. I'm going to yeah. add uh, to that uh, just to really um, nail it down. I, if you, if, if for you to be an effective coach, Forget all the information that you talk about that might be right or wrong. Forget about all your methods. That's also important. But before any of that has to happen, the person has to trust you. Mm -hmm. If they don't trust you, it doesn't matter. You can be telling them everything properly and yep. right, and this is the right way to do it, and they're just yep. not going to believe you. In fact, you gave some tips earlier, like uh, move more, lift some weights, right. Right? basic stuff. Now, yep. if somebody didn't trust you, they'd be like, yeah, he's not telling us the real secrets. He wants me to hire him right, or whatever, right. you, know, uh, you know, whatever the deal is. So they have to trust you first. Yep. People trust people that seem real. Yeah. Okay. Yep. What is real? Real is, I don't know the answer sometimes. Real is, yes. wow, here's how I messed yeah. up. Or I was yes. wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Real. Like that's real. Yes. Not, uh, you know, posting pictures of yourself because you're crying, which is not real. Look at I mean, my, look at my skin rolls that are like, it's like it's, that's not, no. It's like. Yeah. So it's, it's literally saying. Hey, I don't, I remember that first learning that as a trainer where a client asked me a question. I said, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let me find out. Right. And I remember being scared to say that. And yeah. I remember the impact it had on my client. They're like, oh my God, they, they trust me now. Yes. Once they trust you, you can guide them. If they don't trust you. You ain't going anywhere. So that's, you know, just a yeah. little no, cherry that's, on top. I'm glad you said that because that's, it's being able to admit you're wrong, being able to make your mis make a mistake. People will automatically trust you more. Just if you can say like, oh, I didn't know that or I made a mistake, that's 100%. Or even just making a list of here are the things that I was wrong about previously. If you, I, I, I think it's Ben Shapiro who has like a big, a whole website dedicated to things that he said that he wow. that was wrong. I didn't know that. Or, I, and I might be, I, I might be incorrect, but I think it's true. There's okay, like that. a whole thing. That's cool. That's just like, hey, these are all things I said that were actually wrong or incorrect or things I don't believe now. I think it's one of the most amazing things you can do. And, that's cool. And mm -hmm. I'll routine, maybe like once every three to five months, I'll make a post like, here are things I used to think. Here's what I think now. And this is why. And it's like, I think it's really good to have that. So what I'm hearing from all of you right now is that it's, it, to me, it sounds like uh, like true vulnerability. Mm. Like when you are, when you're able to be honest about something, when it may, or when it may not support you or help you, right? Yes. Like saying you're wrong, there's a good chance that that's not going to help your business or you won't be able to profit from that. It won't be a good well, or people might judge you because you say that. What's so, the irony? He'll actually do better. It, yeah. That, 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 yeah. That, is the, that is the irony, but it's like, that's uh, to me, that's what I'm hearing is like the, being real is, is being vulnerable in a situation when it may not serve you no. and yeah. st yet still being, yeah. you know, yeah. true to yourself. It is him. You're right. He just pulled it up. Yes. That's that. cool. And so, I think, I think another thing that's important to clarify is number one is I think these are this is what I think we all wish politicians would do. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like you would <laughs> right? It's like we all crave that. Just just say you made a fucking mistake. Just say right. it. Yeah. But they don't. They always blame it on the other we side. Don't see it, you know. Right? Just admit it. Yeah. And then and then uh the other thing I think is very important with this conversation, because people will be like, okay, so so be vulnerable. And they'll look at vulnerability as a tactic. Yeah. Vulnerability is not a tactic. Right. They'll vulnerability record themselves crying. Or something. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah. That's Who the does worst. that? Who I, picks up a phone that's when they're one crying of my biggest pet dude, peeves, and says, bro, I better so capture this? I 
that is the most nauseating thing when they're like, okay, I'm crying. It's the most narcissistic, Ugh. strange. Uh, it's the worst. Yeah, it's not a tactic. <laughs> it's just the truth. It's fucking weird, it's, dude. Yeah. It's like, what in your mind? And you think that you're being vulnerable with your audience? It's like, no, mm -hmm. you literally thought about grabbing your yeah. phone <laughs> to record when you're supposedly in a very emotional yeah. state. Yeah. Like, there is nothing authentic it's and gross. real about that. It's gross. Yeah. I, I hate that. Yeah. I absolutely If any of you guys that. point a phone at me while I'm crying, I'm slapping that phone right over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but even that, even that is different, right? Yes. Like yeah. me, like seeing that and then recording you, yeah. that, but we'll you do this. Onions. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's no. weird oh. as fuck. You know, to me. I was going to ask you this story because, uh, there's been a, you know, you've been doing this since 2011. I started my website in July of 2011. Okay. So you've been doing this now for over 10 years. There has been this, what seems to be huge and, uh, welcome shift in exercise or at least in the mainstream view of exercise. For a long time, forever, strength training was never considered a form of exercise for longevity mm -hmm. or for health. Mm -hmm. I used to have to convince women yeah. you could work out weights and not become huge, not look like Arnold the next day type of deal. Now I'm talking to um, organizations, major organi organizations that own gyms, like a huge investment company. So gyms all over the world, right? It, but in the US, what they're saying is, is that they're now devoting far less space to cardio equipment and far more mm. space to strength training equipment. We we'll obviously see platforms now in gyms. We see bumper plates in gyms. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing more people now talk about strength training and its benefits. I'm seeing scientists and doctors now mm -hmm. talking about how this is like not just a great way to exercise for longevity, but it might be the ultimate way. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you feel about all, because you're obviously you're a power lifter, you're a strength training guy. How do yeah. you feel about all this? I love it. And it's, yeah. I mean, I remember... I first started getting a strength training when I was like 14 and I would go into public gyms and I would never see anyone lifting well. It, it was, it was doing stupid shit all the time. I can't go into a public gym now without seeing someone deadlifting really well, without seeing someone squatting really well, without seeing someone like doing great pushups all the time. It's amazing. Like every public gym I go to, it's like there's at least one, usually more people training very, very effectively. It's wild to me, yeah. the change in 10 years. And I think there are many different reasons why it's happened. Number one, I know previously a lot of the research was done on endurance athletes. It wasn't done on strength training athletes. Yeah, they didn't have any research. They didn't have any. So it was just like, all right, well, it just must be endurance. That's it. And so now more research has come out through strength training, which I think has, the science was behind. We all knew it, Correct. but the science was behind. And now the science is there like, oh, this is actually really important. Um, I also think that, you know, people are like the, the people, especially like women wanting glutes now mm. has like, all right, well, how do you get these glutes? It's like, well, you got to fucking lift. It's the muscle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, so, so I think that has also like really push stuff forward. Uh, so it's, there are many different aspects of it culturally, scientifically that have, that have contributed to it. But I think it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. You know what? We don't touch on that one a lot. You're probably right that the, the, the butt thing was probably, I mean, let's be honest as as influential as someone like Kim Kardashian is like, you know, she could be responsible for all the deadlifting and squatting. <laughs> is that possible? <laughs> yeah. Do, do yeah. we have to credit her for potentially like yeah. moving the market that much? I mean, she's yeah. that, she's have got that much influence doing that. I mean, she it, doesn't. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've, but she's got a big butt. But she has like a big butt, and then if, if you if you were someone to hire a sure. a, a coach and yeah. trainer and say, "Hey, I want a butt like Kim Kardashian," yeah. what will we all say? Have yeah. Yeah, for I mean, that. We got to yeah. squat and deadlift. You know yeah. what you would say to her. So she, you know, indirectly, inadvertently, yeah, yeah, yeah. could have actually inspired, yeah, inspired, yeah, inspired yeah. influenced the market yeah. that much. No, it's cool to see <laughs> that it's starting to kind of happen now yeah. with the strength training, which is pretty cool. So I'm anticipating. What's going to follow on that is the 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 awareness around workout programming because strength mm -hmm. training, unlike oh well, okay, let's be honest, cardio also needs to be applied properly. Correct. There's still a technique to it and all that stuff, but it's not like strength training. Correct. Strength training programming can it makes a huge difference in how you do it. Not just yes. lift heavy things, but Correct. like how and how you order them. So I almost feel like hopefully in the next ten years we're going to start to see people start to realize like. Oh, beach body. That's not really strength training. That's yeah. like, you know, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. cardio with weights. And I think that this is more, are you getting more, are you noticing more interest in like correct programming or from is that coaches okay, good. from coach and people who want to be coaches from, okay. you know, for the people who are just like, they're not passionate about, it's sort of like, 
I don't know if I was, if I needed a lawyer, I wouldn't be that worried about like why this law came into place or just be like, can you just do the fucking job for me and like yeah. protect me, whatever it is. It's like the, the people who are really passionate about learning. Yeah. Like why this exercise, why this many sets and reps? Like, I think one thing we see right now, especially I'm clearly not in the hypertrophy space very much, but like, uh, uh people talking about mechanical tension more. Why, like, why mm-hmm. should we be doing this? Why should we be reaching this level of fatigue? Why should we be training this hard? What, like, let's talk about the total volume. This is a huge debate right now. Like in the, in the fitness industry, like how much volume do you need? Like, and talking about that, how many days a week per muscle group? So I think we're seeing a huge rise in that. Um, some of it being, going too far like all right like really do you need to really worry about that fucking line of pull precisely exactly or can you just fucking train (laughs) just lift and like go hard and i don't care if it's eight reps or 10 reps or 12 reps maybe you should just lift until like you can't really do many more and you're good but um i think overall program design is becoming it's at the very least it's it's slowly increasing in popularity and understanding that hey this is really important we can't just say like hey, do whatever workout you see on Instagram Reels and expect to see massive progress. You need to have a, a, a legitimate periodized, periodized program. Do you get asked a lot about uh, companies like F45 and Orange Theory? Constantly. What's your thoughts on that? How do you communicate that to people that ask about it? I, I always say, I say, listen, something's better than nothing. Right. And I think like at least they have you moving and you're, you're training and like it's, it's going to be good for your health. Yeah. Is this the ideal program for maximizing your potential? Of course not. Yeah. No, but like it's, I would rather you do this than nothing at all. Right. So, and I think there are some great F45 coaches. I think there are some great Orange Theory coaches. I don't personally enjoy the system, yeah. me as an individual. My wife goes to F45 and she loves it. Yeah. And like she also does like my workouts as well. So she gets the best of both worlds. But like it's, I think, if I were looking at it from a population as a whole, I would rather more people did F45 than sit at home on t- on the couch watch- eating nachos all day. Sure. But like in terms of actual really good program design, like, no, it's, it's not fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I've been doing this long enough to remember when nobody uh, squatted and deadlifted in gyms yeah. to lots of people doing it to now I'm starting to see the backlash again. Yeah. Toward, yeah. How do you feel about that? Like the people are like deadlifting, it's not a great back exercise. Squats, there's, you could get way better results if you just did this, that, the other, or it's not as functional as a split. That's getting know, back to the science, stupid stuff that we yeah. do in the space. I feel like. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about those two exercises right there. How do you feel about? I know you're a power lifter. Yeah. But you also coach lots of people. Yeah. Most of them probably not power lifters. Correct. How do you feel about those two exercises in particular? And how do you feel about the backlash on? I love them. I think the backlash is just people looking for content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or they don't really understand it. Or maybe they were just super weak and they're like, (laughs) (laughs) right. They suck at it. There's got to be an alternative. Hey, that's, yeah. (laughs) You know the truth about that. I mean, and we, I admit that on the show is like, um, you know, my first five, six years as a coach and trainer, I didn't teach squatting or deadlifting Mm -hmm. because I sucked at it. That's, yeah. that's real. It's like, <laughs> I was bad at it. I was bad at it. I was weak at it. It's like I've said, I figured out how to do things without it. And so I literally taught people that it wasn't until I got good at those and then realized the benefits that mm. came with that. Yeah. And I think that's what made me so, I think, hard about men. You've got, and if you can't squat or deadlift, our goal should be to get to that point. Yeah. Right. 100%. Like it's, that's how much value is in that. And I get really annoyed by the coaches that try and break it down scientifically on tension that, oh, we can get that kind of tension on this hack squat or this leg press machine. So there, if you have a client, why should you be teaching that squat? I just don't, I don't like that message at yeah. all. Yeah, and it's, there's a difference between hating on a movement pattern and hating on a, an effort or an intensity, mm. right? It's like hating on a deadlift is just stupid. It's just a hip hinge. Yeah. yeah. Whereas- should I have like a, I don't know, a 73 year old dude, like who like just wants to move better. Should he be going for a one rep max? That's stupid. You're right. mm-hmm. But every single person I work with is going to hip hinge and deadlift in some capacity. Right. Every single one is going to squat in some capacity. Like I might not have everyone doing front squats because I don't know, maybe they don't have the wrist mobility for it or some type of thoracic mobility for it. Or maybe they just don't like the pain that the bar has on their neck. I don't know, but they're going to squat. And they're going to deadlift. They're going to do these things. Actually, the the one that I don't necessarily have everyone do is bench press. Yeah, yeah. Like, isn't that funny? That's yeah. the yeah. least like, and that's the one that we grew up like. That's the one you yeah. compared your that was the How much do you bench? bench. Yeah. 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 It's like I was literally just because I'm I make my own home gym. I was like, 
do I even need a bench press? Like yeah. I've got the squat rack. I've got like a bench. Do I need a separate bench press? Like, I don't even think I'm going to order one. I mean, like, you, yeah. if you can overhead press, well, it's far better for you. Yeah. Health wise, strength wise, functionality wise. Opinion. I mean, I'd say when I think back to my clients, that I used to train like that was probably one of the most glaring things that I noticed in advanced age clients was the inability to even get their hands. Yes. Mm -hmm above their head like i don't need them to bench press anymore but if i could get them to actually be able to press over the head that'd be a huge accomplishment yeah right? I, I don't want to teach everyday people like all right let's lock your scaps back and just shove them down and then just like we're just gonna bench all like i would much rather teach you how to move your scaps properly and get you overhead pressing or single arm overhead pressing something like yeah, yeah. yeah. what are the most uh important things you communicate to the coaches that you work with to help them be more effective oh man that's a great question i mean the number the number one thing is you First, you have to study. Like you have to learn. Like you have to read books. You have to educate yourself. Instagram, TikTok doesn't count as education. Like it just it doesn't. Um, I I've always said, and I've experienced it, is that the I think the best fitness businesses are built on word of mouth, and you can't fake being a great coach if your business is built on word of mouth. That's true. Like I think if if you're really paying attention to your clients and you're you're learning and you're studying and you're giving them great programs, then your business is going to grow. If you are a shitty coach and like you're you're going to churn out and it's not going to do well. So study number one, coach people in person, like we spoke about earlier. I think coaching people in person will make you a better online coach. Being an online coach will not make you a better in person coach. So coaching people in person, and then uh, I like it's. <sighs> I love that advice around word of mouth because we did so many things wrong in, in internet marketing world, building this business. Mm -hmm. And we only survived because the information, the program, the things that we provided were so good. Mm -hmm. And it, what we did really well was take care of the people that did the, the handful of people that were coming through our community got so much had such good results that they went and told so many people and we have slowly grown yeah. for eight years consistently. We did terrible. We are, we never did funnels. Yeah. We, uh, we made the mistake of thinking that email was dead. We didn't even capture emails <laughs> for the first like three years. Know, Huge mistake. Don't do that. Okay. Okay. Don't do that. If you're building an online business, we didn't get on YouTube. We thought it was, so we thought it was ridiculous. I mean, we did so many things wrong, Yeah. but the one thing that we did right was, really take care of our people, really give them great results, really help them like and add value. And like, because of that, we survived all the things we did shitty. Yeah. And I think that's such good advice for a new coach and trainer, because you know what, there's, there is a lot of stuff that you can do with funnels and email marketing and stuff to, you know, bait and switch. And you could probably make some quick money mm -hmm. and be a pretty shitty coach at first. Yeah. But eventually that dies. Exactly. Eventually enough people go through stuff and aren't impressed, didn't see results, get hurt or whatever that. And then they go and they tell people and then that stuff runs out. And so yeah. maybe you make a little bit of money for a little while, but you're not going to have a business that continues to grow. And that's the only thing we did right. I really believe, I believe we did a lot of other things wrong. A hundred percent. I, I mean, love that advice. One, one of the things that you learn very quickly in business is that the person who is most likely to buy from you is someone who's already bought from you. And if you fucked that person over or if you did not do a good job, then they're definitely not going to buy from you again. And so I, I think just number one, being a great coach, which is like, what is a great coach? Like yeah. it's, I, no, it starts with knowledge. It doesn't start with charm. Like there are a lot of really shitty coaches who are super charming and great listeners and everyone, but if you, like a great coach starts with knowledge, then from there being a great listener and also being able to communicate and being able to to change things on the fly, cybernetic periodization, whatever it is, like we could always talk about the the different uh, cues that you're going to use. Like this does, can help contribute to being a great coach. But I, I think that the number one thing it starts with knowledge and and making sure that the people who are with you in person or the small group of community that you have knows that you're there for them 100%. Here's where some people will get challenged with that. Uh, I agree with you, but you're going to get trainers. This is a big um, challenge I hear from a lot of new coaches is that they feel like an imposter. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, I, I learned these things. I did all, you know, I've done all this reading. I've got these certifications. Uh, you know, I've trained a few people. You know, who am I to help this person? Or how can I charge $100 an hour? Or I feel like an imposter. Like, what do you say to coaches that come to you and say, like, I, I don't know, am I, 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 am I worthy of doing this? Or why are people asking me this? And I don't feel like I'm good enough. Yeah, like, welcome to being human. Okay. Like, <laughs> we all feel that way in some capacity. Like, at all at all points in life, it's it's not a justification not to do it. Mm. 
right? It's like, you're welcome to feel that way. That's okay. I felt like that too. But like, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And then if they don't go, if they, if they don't work with you, they're going to work with someone. Mm -hmm. And like, do you feel like you can provide a safer program for them than someone else? If the answer is yes, then like take them on and you don't have to charge a hundred an hour. You could, one thing I used to do when I first started, I was like, I'm going to coach you for free for the first X number of weeks. Totally. Mm -hmm. And then they'd be like, why? Like, well, I'll tell you why. Number one is because I'm learning. I'm still getting my chops in. It's like, I don't feel comfortable taking your money yet. Number two is if you like the results, then after four, eight, 12 weeks, then you can start paying me. But first we're going to do it for free. And then it would be great. And then they got great results. And then I felt more empowered. I was like, okay, cool. I helped this person get results. Now I feel more comfortable charging. And I would start with like $20 for 12 weeks. And it's like, okay, now I'll bump it to $40 for 12 weeks. And like, that's how I started when I was a teenager. It's like, I didn't start by taking money at first. Right. Have you it's heard- taking uh, multiple clients and, and it's all these practices of like gaining knowledge and experience and, and you know, that's what you build off of. And that's, you have to build up that confidence to be a good coach yes. from what I understand. Yeah, which I totally have you, that. have you heard uh, Brett Contreras' story? Do you know how he built his business? I did not find this. We've met him multiple times. He was on the show again for a second time. And Sal asked him a question uh, this time that we had never asked him. I did not know. Do you know how he, like, I, no, do you know that he doesn't charge anybody for his training? Still? I did not know that. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Still That's to this awesome. day, he does not charge <laughs> yeah. people for all the people you see on Instagram. He'd be coaching and training. So with that, he obviously wow. gets something out of it too, but I mean, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's uh, awesome. I know. Promotion. So I, I thought love it, that. I, I love that too. Someone of, of that, that much talent, that much education, intelligence, like yeah. had the same kind of philosophy is just like, I'm just, and he, he, the way he uh, positioned it on the podcast was funny. Cause he's like, you know, if I do that, then you know, if I'm five minutes late, then I feel, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or if I don't, if I, like, I love that. Yeah. It was, his attitude was like, I didn't want that responsibility. Lord I just wanted to help these people. Yeah. I was passionate about doing that. And yeah. so, and then, you know, everybody's so excited because I'm not charging them. And, it, and he goes, and then I can do it in groups and it, I can, they can all learn from me. And so that's, that's awesome. how he grew his business that's was so smart help. And then eventually obviously attracted some of these big name bikini girls right, that had right. huge followings. And then let the results speak for himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's so how great. Do you communicate to people who because this is going to happen who come to you and say carnivore really works well for me i feel so good i don't have any more of these issues or yeah but you know i go vegan and i feel phenomenal or you know i do this other thing and it just it's, it, i think it's really working for me like how do you communicate to those people i it's funny like when i was younger i would go off on a tangent now i'm like good <laughs> that's awesome mm -hmm. and i basically say that and like how's your like if we want to go in deeper, like, well, what do you think? If they start to ask me, what do I think about it? Then I'll be like, well, here's the thing. Like, are you getting your blood work done? Are you checking these levels? Are you making sure you're okay health wise? And like, are you going to the doctor? If that's all good, like, I'm not going to tell them not to do it because the easiest way to make them want to do it more is for me to say like, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's like, that's a bad idea. Then they're going to be like, fuck you. Like, yeah, I'll do what I want. But I feel great. <laughs> yeah, but I, exactly. So it's like, if you feel great, go for it. And then I'll like, I could have conversations like, do you like, is this something you can continue for the rest of your life? And they're like, oh no, no way. I can only do it. I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm like, okay, well that goes against everything you just fucking said. <laughs> so let's talk about how we can maybe make this more sustainable. But if someone just comes to me and is like, oh man, I'm, I'm really loving this. I'm like, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. Good for you. So what's up with someone maybe hearing right now when we're talking is they're like, okay, so what you guys are saying is, uh, I got to figure it out for myself. Well, what the <laughs> hell? Like, okay, that's, I'm even more confused. Are there general guidelines and things that you can communicate around nutrition? Yeah. That tend to, okay. So what, what would those be? I mean, number one, I mean, uh, this is going to be the most like, it's so funny now that like everyone knows I'm about to say protein, yeah. like protein is super yeah. important, but like <laughs> 10 years ago, that was not no, like, yeah, yeah. no. So like protein is obviously like, I think number one, no, I would say, why is that? Oh why is, man. Yeah. Cause it, we have a lot of data to support this now. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, we could talk about number one in terms of if we look at overall health issues, like we're fatter than ever. And which contributes to like the most amount of health issues. Like protein is the number one. It's going to keep you the most full. It's going to help you with your body composition. It's going to be able to help you build muscle. It's like, there's no question. Protein is the, the most impactful from that has the highest thermic effect. Mm -hmm. So like protein is, is just from a body composition perspective alone is going to be the most important. Um, it's from there, like after protein, I would then go to fiber and, and I would, I often put those like side by side. I think protein and fiber, like and when I'm talking to people who they don't want to track calories, they don't want to track macros overall, I'm like, let's just protein fiber. I think that that is for, for me, what I would say is the most important. Uh, both, they both keep you full. Generally, if you're focusing on protein and fiber, it's hard to eat like shit. Mm -hmm. 
Like it's really difficult yeah. to eat like an asshole if you're focusing on protein and fiber. It's like, okay, so I'll have like fish and vegetables <laughs> or like, I don't know, like chicken and also have an apple. It's like eggs and oatmeal. It's like, these are all amazing meals unless you're like getting like the fiber one bars and like that's, and then like, I don't know, like eating like shit that way. But if you're, it's protein, fiber, whole minimally processed foods. If you're doing that, like you really can't go wrong. I'm going to add to this. You're so correct. And I'm going to add to this for someone listening. Here's why the number one enemy to the average person when it comes to obesity, or should I say the number one thing they should search for is satiety, mm -hmm. period, end of story. Yeah. If we, if you feel a sense of satiety, it's not perfect because uh, people eat for lots of different reasons, but you're way more likely to not overeat. Yeah. You're way less likely to impulsively eat. Yep. You're, it's, it just makes things a lot easier. And that's for anybody listening right now. If you're hungry, you have lots of cravings, mm -hmm. good luck trying to live with that um, all the time and eat healthy or make good choices. So those are those two things you named are the most satiety producing foods mm -hmm. or, or, or components of food. And then the second part, which I love that you said, is uh, it's really hard to eat lots of heavily processed garbage and also eat a lot of protein and a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. Even the heavily processed stuff that has a lot of protein and fiber it doesn't taste as good. At all. As the stuff that yeah. does. And so, it doesn't fill you up as much. That's right. So what you just said is so on the money with nutrition. I wish people would just kind of understand. One that. of my favorite things that you do talking about this, this subject is actually you do a really good job, though, of going back and forth on the nuances of that, which is something that we are always having. Because like, I think all of us in this room don't do this where we, we, we say, you know, avoid processed foods as much as possible, go for whole foods, but I'm not demonizing exactly processed foods at the same time. I'm not, and I'm not saying you that processed yeah. foods don't make it in my diet. I'm talking to the masses of like, listen, if you're, you're going to indulge in those things, be aware of the way it's going to make you feel and how it make me want you to eat more. If you stick to whole foods, you might have an easier time staying to your caloric balance. But at the same time, I can show you that I can eat stuff from a wrapper and eat processed foods and still stay fit. So it's right. not like, it's the devil and it's going to make you technically fat. It just it's makes just it harder. <laughs> it makes it more difficult. Yeah. So recognize, and I think that what we did about in the, in the, in the fitness space is like, it's like you're either or mm -hmm. yeah. it's like you either right. got to be the, you know, protein bar shake, uh, all processed food type of person. I, I, F, Y, M, or you have to be this right. hippie, crunchy whole foods. Oh, you gotta, you can't eat any of those. Those are all cancerous foods. It's like, yes. listen, there's, there's a balance here. There's nuance here. And it's that it's not that, that those foods are necessarily quote unquote bad foods. It's that, oh, you, if you eat a lot of processed foods, it's very mm -hmm. difficult yes. to stay within your caloric balance. Correct. If you focus on whole foods, it's much easier, but it doesn't mean you're, you're bad. If like you have a busy day and you have to have beef jerky or a protein bar right. or something on the go. So I think you do a really good job of com communicating that. Do you get a lot of people that because you talk, I know you did a, a kick a while back where you like were eating like bad food and you showed that you lose weight. Like I'm, I'm today's day 29. I'm spiking my blood sugar every day. And I'm still <laughs> losing weight and people are losing their fucking shit. <laughs> but, but to go off of what you just said, I think this is really important. So you said earlier, you noticed that my, my content has dropped a little bit in terms of frequency because I have a kid, right? Yeah. It's like before my business got to where it was, I had to be making a lot of content. And now I've earned the right mm. and the ability, I should say, not the right, the ability to produce less and still be okay. I think that this is also with nutrition. With nutrition, it's, you need to have a flexible diet. I think it's important. But someone who, who is already relatively lean and worked years to build muscle and maintain a good body composition will be able to have more flexibility without it negatively impacting their health. Whereas someone who is maybe a higher body fat percentage, hasn't built as much muscle, doesn't have as good conditioning, isn't as healthy. Maybe they need to be a little bit more rigid for a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they can't enjoy any of these foods ever, but it means like you might be better being like, 90, 92 and a half percent consistent, as opposed to trying to be 80% consistent right now, or 70% I mean, might be better. And I'm not saying for everyone, but I think in order to be like, to, to earn the ability to be more flexible and still make progress, you might have to get to a certain level first. And that's something to be aware of. Yeah. They haven't formed and strengthened those behaviors. Yes, yet, exactly. Right? And they have to learn how to actually like apply that consistently and yes. you know, be able to duplicate that. Yeah. yeah here's a, here's an uncomfortable truth. Uh, and this is definitely oversimplifying things. So everybody relax, but uh, it's a truth. 
that if you consume less than you burn, all the negative effects associated with sugar and certain fats and all these other things, you negate a lot of it, if mm. not most of it. Yeah. Right. So in other words, you can eat McDonald's yeah. every day. And of course, make sure you don't have nutrient deficiencies, stuff like that. If you're not overeating, yeah. you're prob- you're going to be almost fine. Yeah. Not, I won't say fine, but almost fine. Now, with that, the reason why it's an oversimplification is because eating just McDonald's or whatever, it's going to give you more cravings. Correct. You're going to have ups and downs with your mood or behaviors, which then lead to the fact that it's going to be much more challenging. Mm-hmm. But I think people need to understand that that first part. Yes. Now, what you said, I want to get to, uh, which is the muscle part. Yeah. What gives you more of that flexibility? Muscle. Mm-hmm. You Correct. spike your blood sugar. Yep. Guess where that blood sugar gets to go? Correct. Muscle. Right in the muscle. If there's a there's another uh, myth, which is that obese people carry more muscle, but in fact they suffer from higher rates of uh, of sarcopenia. Yep. Okay. Muscle, uh, low muscle, and muscle loss than the average person. So insulin spikes to somebody with a little bit of muscle, not a good idea. You got big quads and a strong back and all that stuff like that sugar is going somewhere. It's going to be stored, especially if they're overeating and they're consi- that's, that's the main issue. That's yeah. right. So yeah. you want that flexibility. Well, let's get your metabolism to yeah. boost a little bit. And you know, what does that you got to build that muscle? Yeah. Sh- share the, uh, share what you're doing right now for the audience that isn't following or doesn't know what you're doing. Right now. And I love when you do these kicks for like the 30 day thing, yeah. just to prove a to educate basically is what you're doing, man. So what exactly is the protocol for what you're doing right now? And what, what, what made you do it? So the thing that, made me do it is i've heard doctors say like you really need to watch the carrots because they're high in sugar (laughs) it's like you fucking idiot like (laughs) like watch the carrots or watch the watermelon because the high glycemic index like really we're talking about the glycemic index like and why would they point to carrots and watermelon uh, right it's like it's not the pizza or the french fries or the ice cream yeah it's like for fuck's sake yeah and i get these all the time in my dms and and clients and members like my doctor said this or my friend said this i'm like I don't care what Carol said. Like, you're welcome to have fucking watermelon. <laughs> it's fine. So basically, uh, right now, a huge viral trend is everyone wearing these continuous glucose monitors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which like, I think they can be good for diabetics yeah. who need them. Um, and they're an interesting form of data. But people are like, one of the most viral things right now on social media is, look, I ate this. Look at my blood and sugar. look at my blood sugar. Yeah. I'm like, uh, that's wow, that's incredible. <laughs> that's a normal, healthy response to eating that food. And so I was like, fuck it. So I have a continuous glucose monitor on right now. Uh, I've had one on for a little over a month. And I was like, I'm going to deliberately spike my blood sugar once a day. And whether it's a donut or yesterday at the airport, I had pink berry with gummy bears. uh, And I made sure to get gummy bears and raspberries so I get the fructose and the sucrose. Uh, (laughs) Would you get criticism for that? Oh, but you didn't have the Uh, the fructose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The gummy bears are okay. People find (laughs) anything to criticize. (laughs) So I've done everything. But I've also done things that have been really interesting. Like, okay, one day I'll have oatmeal, which oatmeal spikes it like fucking crazy. So there's a lot of people hating on oatmeal recently. I love oatmeal. Then I did oatmeal and I also did it with oat- the next day I did oatmeal and protein just to see the difference. Cause it's interesting to sure. see these differences. Yeah. Um, but basically the glucose spikes or bad crowd has lost their fucking mind. Yeah. Cause I'm down as of this morning, 10.4 pounds in 29 days, which is a very aggressive deficit. But I was like, I'm just doing this to make a point. Cause if I only, and that's in quotes, if I only lost like three pounds, they'd be like, it's a water fluctuation. Yeah. Like no motherfuckers. You pooped. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so I, every single day spike my blood sugar, uh, deliberately, usually with something, uh, not considered healthy, but watermelon and oatmeal spike it more than anything. Oh, like wow. watermelon oatmeal are the things that spike it more than absolutely anything, yeah. which is just funny because for me, like I'll eat pounds of watermelon a day on a cut because it's just, it's so filling. Uh, it's delicious. Like I love watermelon. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, people are freaking out, but it's just like, again, it's in keeping control of my calories. Those spikes and, matter when they're supposed to matter. Uh, like you said, diabetic, pre-diabetic. Correct. Uh, they also matter if you can connect them to uh, changes in behavior. Yes. Yes. We work with a company um, that uh, has that uses CGMs, and, but they work with a coach. Mm-hmm. So you wear it. The yep. coach contacts you. Yep. Uh, and then they say, "Okay, we notice these spikes and whatever at this time. Did you get an energy drop? Yes. Did you feel irritable? Yep. If the answer is yes, Did your cravings kick up. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm aware. Oh crap! Yes. When I eat that oatmeal or whatever, yes. 
it does make me have cravings later. Correct. Or, but if you don't connect it to anything, it's completely yes, it's irrelevant. completely worthless. And, and that's been actually really cool for me to look at is in terms of, okay, cool. Like it's funny. I've seen forever since I was a teenager, like blood sugar spikes are bad because then you're going to have a crash and you're going to get hungry. And I've always sort of just taken it at face value, but it's been cool for me to look at different foods. So watermelon and oatmeal, for example, spike my blood sugar like crazy. I also have huge drops. I become hypoglycemic soon after oatmeal, like within a couple of hours, but I'm full for a long time with oatmeal. Whereas a donut didn't spike my blood sugar nearly as high mm. and it didn't go hypoglycemic, but I was starving, which just goes to show like, all right, well, what's more nutrient dense? What has more fiber? It's like, and so it is cool to say like, well, which foods affect you more, not only based on blood sugar, but on everything. I'm so glad. You, I actually think this, you know, you now we're talking about this. I think this is one of the things that someone DM me about where, cause they've obviously heard us talk about NutriSense before. And I think they shared a clip of someone. I'm that. using and NutriSense. I, and I think, yeah. And I think yeah. I was just like, yeah, no, what he's saying is absolutely correct. Like it's not conflicting with what we, t yeah. what we communicate. Like it's, you have to connect it to how you feel and yes. you can feel uh, very different from one thing to the next. There's also an individual variance, which is very interesting. Huge, huge individual Here's what's variance. weird yeah, that yeah. people don't, uh, that people just now are starting to realize. You could have, uh, and they might call it an intolerance or let's say IgG antibodies, whatever, to a particular food that might have zero sugar and carbs. Yep. It could be an avocado or macadamia nuts, but for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe you had leaky gut or whatever, you've now developed uh, a an immune a, a low level immune reaction to it. What does that do? Your liver is going to dump out sugar. Yes. So yep. why are macadamia nuts making my blood sugar spike? Yes. You would never know that had you not worn this and worked with a coach. Yeah. That's the important. So are you are you could you potentially want to work with CGMs with clients or are you you're so in tune with your clients though. I doubt you would even need yeah. that kind so of data. I'm sort of conflicted um Mainly, there, there are a number of reasons I'm conflicted. I think the data is, I love data. Yeah. I enjoy it. I think it's fun. I also know that there are a lot of people who are like, they see there's so much information, they're going to get even more worried. Oh my God, like I'm, it says I'm hypoglycemic. Should I call the ER? Like, shut the fuck up. Like, relax. It's fine. <laughs> um, but um, the other thing, and this is something, this has been, every time I do a challenge, there's something I learned that I didn't expect I would learn. Yeah, that's cool. And in this one, I've spoken to a lot of diabetics and specifically parents of type one diabetics. And this is what's been a huge eye opener for me is it's hard enough to be a diabetic, especially a type one diabetic. I couldn't imagine how difficult it is to be a parent of like an infant or a young child sure. who's a type one diabetic. And you essentially have to function as their pancreas. You have to constantly track their blood sugar yeah. levels. You have to constantly track their insulin levels. You have to make sure every, like when they're out of friend's house, like are they getting what they need? Right. Like it's, and the CGMs, uh, at least here in, in the U.S., I, I know it's different whether it's in Canada or Australia, U.K., because things are subsidized. But I didn't realize like there's there's actually an often a shortage of them, yeah. and, and people are struggling to afford them and people to get them for people who actually need them. So one, the conf, the conflicts I have, one of the conflicts I have is I'm seeing a lot of people using them who don't need them, which is essentially putting the demand for them up much higher which is then rising the price for them, which is making it very difficult for people who need them to get them. Yeah, so I wanna, I wanna let me touch on that. Um, that, uh, yes, but here's what that'll lead to if the demand remains high, innovation yep. and lower cost. Yes, correct. So, um, so it's a shitty situation. This is how all markets work. You'll yes. see demand rise, temporary shortages and prices, because demand goes up, correct. you have only so much supply, price tends to go up. But we're already seeing innovation with CGMs and we're already starting to see more companies try to provide because they're like, oh, the demand's there. Right, exactly. So what this may lead to, which is probably what's going to happen, is over-the-counter CGMs mm -hmm. that are inexpensive because mm -hmm. there's also regulation that make it a pain in the ass. Dude, yeah. Because yep. it's considered, there's a tiny, for people that know, the CGM has like literally it's the size of a hair. And it's super, super small, and it goes inside your arm. I don't even feel it when I put it yeah, in. No, it's not. I a, literally it's, don't. Feel it's it. not a needle. It's literally like a hair. Yeah, okay? like a mosquito. Yeah. Okay. And because of that, the regulation says it has to go through this process of mm. whatever. So what I think is going to happen if this if the demand remains high is you know hold on everybody we're about to have really 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 innovative mm. cheap CGMs. Uh, maybe Apple watches will offer it or who knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we pull the demand back because of guilt or whatever. I hadn't uh, thought about that. Yeah, yeah. then it could, it I could make it a lot harder. I hadn't thought about that. It's a really good point yeah. that 
aligns with what I believe, but I hadn't taken it that far. I hadn't gotten to that logical step. Yeah. So that makes total sense. Yeah. You know, the part that's most important about it is the part that you like, because we all like the data and stuff like that, is that you are connecting how, you know, regardless of where the blood sugar goes up or down is how you feel and how that changes your cravings and behaviors, yeah. which is the most important piece. Right. And I think that's the, the biggest takeaway from any, and I mean, I feel the same way about testing body fat. I feel the same mm -hmm. way about entering your food into a macro counter. Yeah. All those things. It's like none of that data really matters unless it, what you see changes your behaviors around that. Yes. If it doesn't change your behaviors or in negatively impacts your behaviors, then it's all like, I remember when Doug uh, first started wearing the aura ring. Yeah, and we, they the aura sent us all all free rings, and so we're all we're all I'm wearing mine. I like it. He's like, I noticed I got shittier sleep. Yeah, because yeah. I was so competitive with <laughs> my score. getting a better <laughs> yeah. score that it stressed me out before I went to bed, yes. and so I got worse because I do better with sleep. And yes. it's just like that's a perfect example of like how this could be a tool for somebody and help educate, inform, and help you make better decisions. And then a, another person, it could be totally negative. You have to as a consumer be able to decide that for yourself yeah. is like, what kind of person am I? Am I going to be able to take this information, not get freaked out because it goes up or down or with that, but go like, Oh, start to connect the dots of, Oh, when I have these foods, yeah. I do notice this happens. And I do notice that these things, or it keeps me fuller you, longer. You brought up too. Uh, you brought up body fat testing and macros. There were clients I trained where body fat testing and macros sent them in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yep. Literally would make it stressful for them, anxious, or right. would contribute to like dysfunctional eating. Right. And we never tested body fat. We would never count a macro. And I just had to find yeah. different ways around it. I want to ask you this as a father, because I know you're thinking about, your daughter's only one. Correct. But you're a very self-aware man. You're obviously very involved with your family. You're probably thinking at some point, education. Yeah. How's my kid going to learn things or whatever? Now, as a coach and trainer- you're a, you're a teacher and you've learned that you got to coach people and train people differently. Right. And there's an effective way to do it and there's an ineffective way to do it. And if your client is not doing great, you probably ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? Yep. yep. Not what are they doing? Why, what, why is it their fault? But rather, okay, what am I doing wrong? Right. Thinking about that, looking forward with your kid, how do you feel about education with your kid? How do you feel about the whole process and looking at that and how am I going to get my daughter what kind of education am I going to put her in? What she, how is she going to learn? And is the system really the best way that we currently use? Or are there different ways? Like, have you had these conversations with your wife? In terms of like the school system? School and any education. Yeah. 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 So my entire mom's side of the family are educators, superintendents, wow. principals, professors. My cousin's a professor of Native American history at GW. Uh, everyone's professor, except my mom. She was a lawyer. So like everyone's in that world. And I was terrible in that world. Like we were talking before we started recording, I was in special education. I was the black sheep of the family. I was I was just terrible in school. The irony, you probably make the most money in your family. Too, no? <laughs> <laughs> just kind of point that out. I think that's kind of cool, right? I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> they, it, they, and my mom still, no matter what, to this day, she'll be like, you know, it's not too late to go back to school. Oh, <laughs> she does not say that. Swear to God. She does not say that. Swear to God. Never really swear to God. Like, maybe I'll buy a school, mom. Actually. <laughs> Wow. What, if, what, what if you put that all towards becoming a doctor? Science <laughs> <laughs> school for so the like, ADD. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, she was literally just in town the other week. So you could always go back. Uh, but um, oh, that's funny, mom. He's rich uh, and he's successful. Oh, he's great that's that. so funny. Leave him alone, mom. Uh. I uh, I obviously have a strong bias, but I do not like the the way that the current education system is set up, and at least like from what I've seen, especially like I just I don't like it. Um, so we were talking about homeschooling. It is something that we're definitely considering. Um, I just, I need to learn more about it. The thing for me is I know everyone learns differently and what wasn't good for me might be good for someone else. My thing, especially with, with my daughter and God willing future kids is I just want them to know that what grades they get and how they perform in school, in my opinion, means literally nothing in regard to what their future success will be like. It means absolutely nothing. I care more about the effort that they're putting into things. I care more about how kind they are. Are they a good listener? Can they speak? Are they well-rounded? Like I, I care more about that than I do about their grades than I do about fucking, do you know what a rhombus is? Like, I don't know what a fucking rhombus <laughs> is. Like, I don't care. So, um, there's a lot for me to consider and I'm not sure to be, I just don't have the answer yet, but there are many different things we're, we're trying to figure out and discuss and we have a few years, but um, 
I, I don't know what, what route we're going to go, but it is something that I'm not going to make a light decision with. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You're, you're, you're actually, I didn't learn this till much later, unfortunately, after I was a dad and everything, and this came, this occurred to me later on. It's like, I know what this should look like because this is how I train people. Mm -hmm. It's really not that different. I'm yeah. training people. They're my students and I'm really trying to help them. And everybody's different. Yeah. And I have to appreciate that. And what may be challenging for one person is easy for someone else. And then I got to figure out how to make that challenging thing not so challenging. Yeah. They just don't do that in, in the school system, unfortunately. Yeah. They don't look at it that way. So, Well, you have to understand the origin of it, right? I brought this up on the show the other day. Like, I mean, I remember first learning about, like, this was like the Rockefellers and the, like, they all came to government and said, like, how do we... Make more workers. Yeah. How do we make more workers? Yeah. Like, we created the current public system with that intended. So, true. so yeah. to think to not to if you don't understand that and to think that like that is the best okay, yeah, that is the best way. If we wanted a bunch of factory mm -hmm. workers, if that was the desired outcome, if we were, you know, a bunch of people that owed massive companies and we want all these people to work for us, then this is how we should do this school system. But and if that's what I guess you want for your kid, you want your kid to go work for some Fall factory. Yeah. Right. Then okay, then maybe it is for you. Otherwise, it's definitely not the most ideal way for us to educate whatsoever yeah, yeah. what do you, what do you because obviously when you when you communicate um you do communicate things like weight loss and strength and looking better but you also communicate a lot about health yeah health uh longevity enjoyment you know it's like you know you want to live not just be alive type yeah. of deal. I've, I've heard you talk about that when you look at health you, you obviously know nutrition you know exercise. I'm sure sleep was something you started to l learn a little later. Yep. I think all of us start to Correct. figure that out yeah, a little yeah. later. Like why sleep matters. Yeah, why does that yeah. matter? Why yeah. is it important? That wasn't something I thought about early on Correct. at all. Um, are you? Have you looked at or or the data behind things that give us purpose, like spirituality, mm. religion, yes. and those kind of practices? Yeah, it is. Okay. That was actually to be uh, – so I started in college with exercise science, and I dropped out – from that degree within the first two and a half months. And I moved to health and behavior science, like behavior psychology. And that for me was, I think it was a great change in terms of communication with clients, but also for me learning about like, what brings people happiness? Like what, what is joy? What makes them enjoy life? What makes them feel good in life? So yeah, in terms of, in terms of actually looking at not just people who are successful in terms of money, but people who are happy, that to me is is very intriguing. And so I, I love looking at that research. Yeah. So how do you communicate that coming? From, I know you have a spiritual background. Yeah. I know you probably talk to a lot of people that aren't. How do you communicate the importance of that to a bunch of people who are, you know, that don't have faith or don't believe and mm. don't have a religion or anything like that? How do you, how do you communicate that to the masses? Yeah. So that's a great question. It's, I always go back to number one, I'm not going to tell someone what they need to believe because as soon as you tell them what they need to do, they're going to be like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so for me, it's been less about like, Hey, you need to do this. And, it's, and people will often ask me like, well, you seem very happy and you seem very fulfilled. And I'll talk about what's fulfilled me. And I'll talk about my relationship with God. And, and usually when we talk about God, they'll, they'll ask like, well, so you believe in God? And I'll be like, well, yeah, of course I believe in God. And, and I'll be like, what do you think God is? And we'll go down these philosophical type discussions and, and oftentimes their view of what God is, it, it's, it's something that maybe they were taught when they were in first grade. And it's just like, they've never expanded their view of what God is or what spirituality is. Um, so we'll have these conversations. And I think through that and through watching, then they can learn how to incorporate it more into life and be more open-minded to it and understand that, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that generally speaking, people who believe in God and, and who have faith and, and have more spirituality are happier, healthier, and live longer. Like you can't really argue with that based on the research. So I think just having these conversations with them and, and then just hanging out and, and being part of my community, whether or not they, they are like, I'm Jewish. I don't need you to convert to Judaism, yeah. but like, like, for example, I, I've done Bible study classes with friends of mine who are Christian. Uh, literally, like uh, my buddy, Sean, um, and my buddy, Esteban, you know, Sean Lowe from The Bachelor? Um, mm. so he, he's a great friend of mine. We're reading, uh, more than a carpenter right now, which is like, it obviously is about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not Christian, but like, I like to learn about this stuff and I like to have conversations with people about this stuff because I think learning about other religions and other people's faith will improve your own and it'll give you more insight into how to view God and how to have your, I, I think for me, the number one thing that's helped me is understanding that God wants a relationship with me. Mm. Like God wants me to talk with him. God wants a relationship with me. And 
through that and through communicating this with people, I think that, okay, like I can have these conversations. I can, I can try and develop a relationship with God and in whatever capacity that means to them. But through, I, I think it's easier to not have a relationship with God than it is to have a relationship course, with God. It's very difficult to continuously strive to have a relationship with God. And, and I think, uh, now people are starting to really, okay, I'm craving this relationship. I'm crazy. I, this effort to put into it. And so I'll try and talk about it from that perspective. And, and it, sometimes it works well. Sometimes people are like, you're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> it's like, that's okay. Like the good news is like, I don't need you to do it. Like I'm just explaining why I do it and how it has contributed to my life. Do you, you, you know, what I found interesting is that, um, I've said this before that the pursuit of health, let's say through fitness, that if you pursue it long enough, you start to ask these questions mm -hmm. because yeah. health encompasses all these things. And you said it earlier, the data totally shows this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think health and fitness or fitness in particular is just a great personal growth vehicle if you just pursue it long enough? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm just like health and fitness, of course. You yeah. can't, I, I, I think it'd be if you actually truly pursue it. I don't think you could not get better as mm -hmm. a result of it, right? And there's an argument to be made that like if you're actively pursuing anything, like you're going to get better in some capacity. Like if you're truly, not like half-assing it, not like saying you are, but like like tr if you're truly pursuing something, then I think you're going to be getting better in some capacity. And I think health and fitness is one of those amazing things where when you actively pursue it, it's not just you getting better. It's everyone around you getting better as a result of it. People are watching you. People are seeing you. You're able to provide more. You're able to do more. It, it's it's so much more than just yourself with health and fitness when you actively pursue it. And I think the same thing with religion. I think the same thing with, with building a business. Like if I'm actively pursuing my business, I'm definitively helping more people. I'm definitively impacting more people. And, and that process of going through it and dealing with the road bumps, dealing with the blocks, dealing with the, all the obstacles along the way, like – you can't not get better from that. I also think it, it inevitably will lead to the spiritual question. Yeah. Because once you check all the other boxes, like, oh, okay, I got the <clears> sleep <throat> thing down. Oh, I got the water, the nutrition, the strength training. And then eventually it leads you to like, there's something else there that I could do to improve my life. And because of all the research that supports somebody that is that has some sort of religious or faith uh, belief and how uh, how much healthier they are because of that, whether that be through community or whatever it is, I think it eventually at least leads you to start asking those questions. Yeah. And then those people that I have found that are in denial of that say, oh no, I'm super healthy and I'm, and I'm atheist and this and that, like they have found some other way to kind of try and fill that void of spirituality on that, whether that be through, you know, claiming it's the universe and spiritual and uh, crystals and all this other stuff. It's like sooner or later you find something to try and fill that void because yes. it's in everybody. I feel well, like don't you think it's, it's somewhat back to your original point of, of us trying to make everything so much more convenient mm. and like our whole society's moving in that direction of uh, everything needs to be ease of access and, we need to sort of relinquish ourselves from hard things. Yeah. When in fact, the hard things are usually where you find the most purpose, right? Yes. And so the, then I could see where spirituality, it's hard, you know, yeah. having a relationship with somebody for a long time, just one person, that's really hard, you know, and uh, being a good example continuously and doing the right thing, that's hard. Uh, and so I, I don't know, I, for me, like, it just seems like a lot of this, it, it's awkward for people to talk about, you mm -hmm. know, and, and where, how does this relate to fitness? How does this relate to overall health? Uh, but don't you see that's, that's, it's all encompasses like who you are as a human being. Yeah. 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 I completely agree. Yeah, if you, yeah. well, I mean, here's the deal. Like you could, you could do the fitness and diet and sleep, um, perfectly. Shit's going to happen. Yeah. Like, what's going to get you through it? Yeah. You got to have some kind of purpose and drive to get through the shit because it's going to happen no yeah. matter what. Now, being fit, healthy, and strong means you're more resilient. Yeah. And you'll go through less avoidable shit, but yeah. shit's going to happen, you know, no matter what. There's there's something where, not to belabor the point, if you want to skip this topic, I'm all, like, no, but we the, brought it up. Don't worry. We all go through like <laughs> ups and downs, all yeah. of us, right? We all go through shit. I think a lot of people, when they're in a really, good point in their life they're like i'm the best they're like oh, yeah. yeah like i'm i it's got ego it coming in, yeah. but then when shit hits the fan and they're like well what happened i'm not the best anymore it's like well the the person at the top of their totem pole was them mm -hmm. and now it's like well now you're at the bottom of the totem who do you look up to now and it's like i think to to have god as like the constant no matter what is like no matter what you're going through good times bad times it's like 
you're not above you're, you're like you are not the top of the totem pole at all and so for me it's like it's i think it, it's easy i think for people in bad times to go to god it's harder in good times to go to god and that's arguably the most important time because it always keeps you in check yeah well now you 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 were uh born and raised in it has it evolved and changed for you like your beliefs your faith like yeah like has it has it changed like from what childhood and like did you go through because i grew up in it too so i was born and and then i in it and then i went through a phase in my teenage years where i was like totally like not following anything didn't care and then i came back around later on in life and just had a different outlook on on my faith have you have you gone through a similar journey? Have you been consistent with the like what your parents taught you? This is how I believe. Like, how's that journey been for you? Yeah. So, so I was I'm born and raised Jewish. My mom was brought up in like a very like uh, conservatively Jewish house. Um, my father was not at all, and like he hated religion. Oh, interesting. So it was a huge debate in my house. Like any time it was the Jewish holidays they would always get in fights. My dad would leave. Like it was always like a time of like, it was very tumultuous in the house during those Jewish holidays. I also went to, I went to regular school and I also went to Hebrew school and I loved it. Like I loved going to Hebrew school. I, I, I there's never been a point where I doubted God. There's just, my relationship has evolved mm -hmm. throughout the years. And I ended up, I went to Israel after high school. I took a year off. I lived in Israel for a year and then I came back and I went to school and I went back to Israel for several years and Israel for me is where it's just like things just made so much more sense where it's just like, this is, there's no question in my mind. Um, and so at, I sort of look at it similar to fitness, which is funny because we're going back to it where it's like, I've always been very involved in fitness. I loved health and fitness. I love strength training. I love working out, whether it was wrestling, whether it was powerlifting, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's whatever it is, like the, the methodologies and the actual things would change, but I was always fitness oriented. Mm -hmm. My relationship with fitness has changed throughout the years. Same thing with my religion and with God, where it's like, sometimes I was more into it. Sometimes I was less into it. Sometimes I was in this aspect. Sometimes I was in that aspect. But like, I think now as I've gotten older and I have a family, I've become far more, uh, I, I far more um, in touch with how I really want to have a constant relationship with God. And, and when I was younger, it was like, okay, there are times to pray. There are times to talk to God. And now it's like, you could do it all day. You could do it anytime you want. You don't have to be in a house of prayer. You don't need to have, like, you can talk with God anytime you want and you can have these conversations. And, and that for me, I think is one of the biggest changes in probably in the last year since my daughter was born is I try and have these conversations all throughout the day. You know, what's interesting mm -hmm. is this is what I like about uh, fitness so much is it's such a simple, basic microcosm of a lot of s different things. Mm. To be successful with fitness, you need to have practices. You need to develop some kind of disciplines. We would call that in religious practices tradition. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, that Jewish people do very well is they have, they, they, there's a lot of culture and tradition yes. around what they do. Yeah. So, and that's a good thing because uh, you're there, you're practicing, you're connecting it to lots of other people. Um, and like fitness, eventually you can get to the point, like I can get to the point and I've been doing this for so long. I don't necessarily need a schedule. Yeah. I don't necessarily need a planned workout, but it tends to look that way because I've done it for so long and I, mm -hmm. I see the value. I think that's true with any practice. With yeah. any practice, it's like, well, I'm starting this practice. Oh, I can do this whenever I want. And well, you probably need to schedule it. Yes. Make a structure, make a discipline, because that's really the only way you can get better at something is, is by doing that. I think you, you're, you're, you know, your culture does that very well. And I would say it's probably why um, it's, it's, you, you can see that kids of families tend to mm. continue it because you grew up yeah. following these practices. Yeah. You know, I got yeah. something that you'll you'll like because I know you like Jordan Peterson. We uh, he came here to San Jose. We went and saw him live, and my favorite part of it, uh, even though I enjoy listening to him go on his like lectures, my favorite part was the very end where people got to ask, uh, like they had this thing where you text and he'd just pick a live question and then answer it. And one of the first questions was, you know, if he could go back and do something different with the way he raised his kids, what mm. would he do different? You know what his answer was? No. Take my kids to church every Sunday. Uh, and then he and then he went on to say that, you know, the part that he says is really, and he's like, I think we did a really good job with our kids. He goes, but I think it's very arrogant of us sometimes to think like, you know, just because we, we don't believe in a certain religion or b believe in God. Um, that we are just going to completely ignore the values of teaching them a, a moral foundation like that. Mm -hmm. And 
He's like, so if you're going to be that confident about not taking your kids to that, what are you doing on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning for your kids every week, mm. every single week, as far as teaching them those values that they are going to get by going to a Sunday or Saturday service like that. And he go, and it, like, really, that really opened my eyes on things. Cause I, I kind of, as I've gotten on my journey, moved away from like the church setting or whatever mm. like that, just because I'm not a big fan of a lot of the hypocrisy that happens in those type of communities, but now recognize too, like, well, I better step up then yeah, and, yeah. and organize something for my kid to be learning every single well, every single week. Whether you like it or not, they're going to be religious. Well, it'll they're be gonna, either the environment mm -hmm. or this cause or this political out there. party. Yeah. They're going to become religious. So, well, that's I, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. what what I took from that was they're in. You know, you don't have to say religious. But somebody is going to indoctrinate them in in their beliefs, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, would I rather my public school system or even private school system to be the ones that teach them those moral values, or would I rather it be uh, a church that mm -hmm. I, I believe in the values, faith in, or myself? And it's like, so if I'm going to be arrogant enough to say I'm going to ignore and not do that, then I best step the fuck up and yeah. be doing it every single week, or else somebody else is going to. And you know, it's so funny the. <laughs> People that they, they they love to hate on religion and they'll often say things. Oh, you're all hypocrites! But it's like, are you perfect? Have you never been hypocritical at, at any point in time? Like, it's I think people are so quick to be like, well, I don't do that because like you're all liars. Like, listen, there are good people and bad people in every walk of life. They're, they're also human. And er, they're all humans, right? Yeah. And um, and I I feel like just because some people in that group have made mistakes or some people like, like and that's putting it lightly. Like some people have made sure. like terrible, like awful, like some of the worst things you could ever imagine. But it doesn't mean there's nothing you can take from other people in that group. And it doesn't mean it's not going to make you better as a whole. Uh, and I just think that one of my favorite quotes is we often judge our, and I didn't make this quote up, but we judge ourselves by our intent and other people by their actions. Yeah. Huh. And, and it's, yep. that has been very helpful for me in mm -hmm. terms of casting judgment and in terms of writing people off very quickly. It's like, it's like, have I never lied before? Yeah. Have I like, have I never like, like it, we've all done stuff. So it's like, all right, how about we just like take a minute and focus on focus. Let's focus on the things that will make us individually better. And as a community better. And like, for me, I, I haven't found many places like on for Jews on Saturday. So you go like better than go to synagogue and let's listen to something. Well, really let's, great. let's take a full yeah. circle. Uh, this is what people do to trainers and coaches. Oh, you preach about, I saw you eating that cheese. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, oh, you're missing your workouts. What are you talking about? Right now, type it. I'm not going to listen to you. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same damn thing. It's like, well, that doesn't take away from what we're talking about and that there's accuracy here. And yeah. listen, you know, I'm in fitness. Does that mean I don't struggle with yeah. not wanting to work out in the morning yeah. or wanting to be lazy or, you know, eating whatever? Of course I struggle with that. Everybody does. Do you know who said that quote? I love that. I don't know who said I I should look it That's up. Really I, I don't know. Who said I, I love it. that because. You know, oftentimes I get asked about like people that um, I'll either listen to or befriend. And many times people will look at those people and say things like they did this or they yeah. do that. And like, how could you like that person? It's like, but the way I can get through that is I choose to believe, believe that this person has good intentions. Yes. Yeah. Even if they have this past, they did this, they did that. It's like, I choose not to focus on that. Yeah. And I prefer to focus on the part that I want to believe is a good character, oh. which allows me then to build relationships. Stephen Covey with, yes. said that. Stephen Covey said that. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, we got that for you. There, oh, that's uh, the Seven Habits. That's right. Right. Yeah, that's a great book. Yeah, There's yeah. Uh, That's been a big like political talking point in recent years where people say things like intent doesn't matter. I'm like, it absolutely matters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like intent I think is off is equally, if not more important, way more important. It, yeah, it's important. because it's, we've all said things and phrased things in a way that maybe we didn't mean it in that way. Maybe we didn't have the, the, the action we took didn't best represent our intent, but what you actually meant to do Mm -hmm. Is incredibly important. This is not. This is not Absolutely. a debate. The law even recognizes it. If yeah, you yeah. accidentally kill someone, terrible travesty, horrible travesty, you are not treated the same Correct. by the law That's as if point. you intended on killing someone. In fact, you could intend on killing someone and fail. Yeah, and you'll probably go to jail. Yeah, just because right. of the intent. So uh, it's a silly. It's a great silly, point. Yeah, it's a silly debate that. Uh, yeah, we judge people differently, though. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. us as people, right in society, totally. I think that's so funny. What have been your biggest challenges 
recently for yourself, maybe over the last, let's say five years personally, or maybe even your business, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome? Oh man. Um, I think, so my, my greatest fear, so I didn't grow up with money at all, at all, did not have money. Um, I, we had money, like I was able to survive and have a roof over our head, but it was, did not come from a, a wealthy family at all. And it was always like, that was that and like religion were big issues in my house. Mm. Um, so one of my deep seated fears is always around losing everything. Mm. And so like, I don't even like to look at my bank account. I don't like to look at income. I don't, it's like, it's scary for me. Mm. Um, my assistant will be like, Hey, like this is the month. Da, da, da. I'm like, don't tell me. Like I hate hearing it. Like, oh, wow. I hate it. Um, and that is something where, uh, as I've achieved more specific, not in terms of success, but in terms of income, it's been a huge fear of mine and a huge anxiety of mine because the greater it gets, the more I have to lose. Oh, mm. interesting. Yeah. Uh, and huh. so, so that's been a huge, um, I could use the word battle. It's just been a, a huge point that I'm trying to work on and improve, um, and it's always, whenever there was a point in my career, which fortunately I haven't had this in many years, but early on when I would try to make more money, my anxiety would go up and my business would do more poorly. Whereas when I focus less on money and more just on telling the truth, helping people, things tend to go the right direction. But I also recognize that the anxiety that's there, I don't want it there. So I'm trying to face it more head on. I'm trying to be more aware of it. I'm trying to to have discussions around it more and, and not just ignore it because it's like the worst thing you can do because you build up a bigger monster. But that that is something that I, I've struggled with over the last few years. Mm. That's really interesting. Okay, so what do you... What's funny is, it, is that what do some, you what do you do because of that, right? So are there yeah. things that uh, I mean, do you are you like super tight with your money because you are like that way? Yeah, so and I, hang on to it, and you're less likely to like, let's say, you know, you're with some family or friends, and you know, you easily could afford a five hundred dollar dinner if you wanted to, but that's like, oh my god, why would I do that? Are you like that? Is that so? So I've saved to a fault. Thank God, it's been very good. Like, but. I've never, like, I don't have an issue on spending money on experiences or people, like, whether it's my mom or going out to dinner with people, but, like, I never really buy anything for myself. Um, but what, I, what I've done is I've tried to educate my more, myself more on money. I've tried to learn about money, whether it's reading, like, Thomas Sowell or like, who, I, who just helped me tremendously, learning more about finance, learning more about markets. Um, it's helped me become more logical with it. And uh, I, do you have a tough time investing because of fear of losing? Like, are you like super like, no, I'd rather save it. Oh no, I invest like, oh, okay. and that's, but, but it's been helpful. Like okay, I've, I've, I invest every month in a considerable portion of my income every month. Um, and uh, not to go back to religion, but like a huge part of, of Judaism is, is making sure you have money, but also then charity. So a huge portion of my income every month goes to investing and also charity and then saving. Mm. Um, it's more, it, it's more just like that, the fear of like, I could lose it all. So we just bought land. We just bought some land. We're going to build a house. That is fucking petrifying. <laughs> that is like, I, I have never been, not never like the amount of stress that I have now with buying the land and building the house. I'm like, holy shit. Like I'm, it's, it's tough. So like I literally, like, and I'll just be fully honest. I called the architect a week ago and I was like, we're cutting the budget in half. <laughs> I, I was like 50%. He's like, what? He's like, they had the whole house already made up. I was like 50%, cut it. He's like, what? So we're talking about it. He's like, maybe this is an emotional reaction. <laughs> 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 so like, we're talking about it. Eat but, something. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's have a, let's take a breather. But like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, very stressful on that front. So that that is the biggest amount of money and biggest investment I've ever made in my life. What I'm very excited about, but also scared shitless over. How similar or different are you than your wife in that situation? Um, so my wife is like very even keel. Like she doesn't really get stressed at about really much at all. Um, so she's my balance on that. She'll be like, she's she's. She's much just like, all right, well, let's just talk about it. And it's fine. Like she, it, it, if we like were the same, it would be bad. It would be like a volcanic eruption. 
I'm much more like, oh my God. And she's like, okay, well, let's just talk. And then we'll, 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 she's so calm. My, my wife is just very, very calm and she's very go with the flow. She's like very Zen. Like, so it's, it helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. So you know, she's like either way, like, oh, we could spend a bunch of money on that or we can't. I yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's right. not like, we need this. Do you said this? And she's like, okay, well, you know, I'll be happy even if we just rent whatever. Like, so, okay, cool. Let's just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's super interesting about this is that somebody who has fears around money could go in like three different directions. I know. He, it, his, mm -hmm. Isn't his story like, totally? You, you, okay. we have a very similar story. Oh, but really? I'm the opposite. Okay. Like, I obsess about money. I Not a day goes by. I don't look at all my accounts, what we made, what the, like everything. <laughs> yeah. I obsess over <laughs> it. Yeah. movement. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. And I have the exact same like religious um, money, art, even the talking about the fighting, all that stuff is the same. Like yeah. we grew really? up a lot of like, we married a woman very, very similar. Yeah, so, yeah, but yeah. yet I'm the opposite. I obsess over that. That's the, so funny. Yeah, yeah. I also know people. <laughs> I also know people who grew up that way who spend it real fast yeah. when they get it because yeah. they're afraid and they're like, get it out, right. buy, yeah. whatever, and Urgency. they don't have. Isn't that interesting? It is it, how different we can all react to different, you know, situations and stressors. Do it's, you think about that with raising? Because I think a lot about that too. With like how, like, so one of my fears, yeah. of raising a kid because I grew up the complete opposite. Like my, my son will be very much so in a privileged, yeah. you know, lifestyle. Um, and so my biggest fear of it is him being overprivileged, right? I know that the things that made me successful was part of that adversity mm -hmm. was not having working yep. towards like, so I, uh, my fear is like, I don't want him to be spoiled. I don't want yeah. him to think that we can just buy whatever we want. Like, so like, I think a lot about that and like what, how I'll educate him in the future with money. Like, do you think about that already? With all your the time. Oh, okay. Even before she was born, I was thinking about it all the time. And I was asking friends and mentors of mine, how is it like, I don't want them to be spoiled and da, 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 da. And, um, <laughs> one, one of the greatest lines that I heard, I forget who it was, but my buddy told it to me. He was like, well, yeah, there's like, if your if your daughter or, or your kid says like, Hey, I want money. It's like, no, you're like, if your daughter is like, Hey, I'm rich. It's like, no, you're not rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. Yeah. And I forget. That's Shaquille O'Neal who said that. Is that Shaquille? Yeah, it's, it's Shaq, such... Shaq said that line when it's, when he's to his kids, like, no, 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 you're yeah. not rich. I'm rich. And, <laughs> I mean, I, I think there's, I think what my, my mom did out of necessity is a lot of what I'll adopt in terms of like, I remember a lot of kids got allowance. I didn't get an allowance. Yeah. And I remember like there was one kid, his name was Tucker. And he, for however old he was, that's how much money he got a week. So he got like, when he was seven, he got $7. When he was eight, he got $8. And like when he was 15, he got 15. Oh, interesting. And I was just like, and I was, told my mom, I was like, well, he gets money. And she was like, well, what does he do? And she's like, well, he cleans the dishes or I'll take the trash out. And I was like, and I do that and I don't get money. She's like, well, yeah, because you live under my fucking roof. <laughs> it's like, and so that's going to be the same thing. Like, you're not going to get an allowance just for living. Yeah, yeah. Like you, it's like, I, I'm taking care of your food. I'm taking, like, I'm yeah. driving you to whatever it is. It's uh. Yeah. so I think a lot of that will be how I raise my daughter and again, God willing, future kids. But there's also, I think the very real understanding of you can't fabricate the fear that maybe we had growing up because the fear was built out of arguments. The fear mm -hmm. was built out of yeah. real issues. The fear was yeah. like, why don't we go on vacation? Yeah, the like, lights really didn't come on. Ex like, exactly. <laughs> like that really happened. It's like, you can't fabricate those things. So inherently there will be more comfort. Yeah. There will be, but I, so, I mean, I don't know if that fear was a good thing for me. Maybe it was. I mean, I, I actually do think there are a lot of great things that come from fear. I think a lot of, I know a lot of people who've lost a hundred pounds because they were fearful. A lot of people who've done amazing things mm -hmm. because they were fearful. So I do think that fear is an important aspect in behavior change. Um, but I also think there's a huge importance in understanding that they're not entitled to it. And when, and just because you have money doesn't mean they're going to feel entitled to it. That's entitlement mm -hmm. comes from giving, not earning. Right, right. Yeah. You have to be also worried about like, overcompensating going the other way. So yes, too. exactly. Like, I also did accumulate all this so my kids could have a good life. Yeah. I think that's the hard part well, just, where we're at, right? It's like a yes. balance. Make everybody feel better here because we're all dead. If you look at the data, if you if your kid feels loved and there's some structure which provides security, yeah. that's like 95%. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, yeah. of everything. Yeah, you're doing it's like well. it's like with fitness, right? Like, oh, you eat whole natural foods, you lift weights sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you walk. Yeah, yeah. It's like ninety five percent of it, and that's what the data shows. It's like you know, you could have a lot of things that you mess up on, but if they feel loved, yeah, and secure, you're doing a, a damn good job. I like, the fact that you think about it alone means you're doing. A good I like job. what uh, <laughs> I like what Patrick Bet David does with his kids. I think it's really neat. Like he'll like so if they want like obviously he's like uber rich. Is this the yeah. books thing? So yeah, well yeah, yeah. So he'll put like so the kid will want like a, you know, five hundred dollars Star Wars Lego thing, and he'll actually put it like super high in the house, like, yeah, like elevate it based off of like how, and it represents amount of pages. I love that. And so like he'll get it right away. Yeah, but it's like it sits in that house, and they don't get to play with it Unless or you read all those books until yeah. they read a certain amount of books that equal whatever that. It's the, so smart. I I saw a, a, a clip of that. And the comment section was wild. I know. People are like, this is abuse. And I'm like, you don't what? know what abuse is. Like, <laughs> That's abuse. You're like, you are so dull. Like, it's what an amazing tool to so like, hey, well, yeah, number one, if you want that, you're going to have to work for it. And like, let's get you to work for it by learning, right. educating yourself, like understanding that it's not just enough, like, Cleaning the dishes, yeah, that's great. That's a form of, of putting in work and helping the community. But you can also do that in 10, 15, 20 minutes. Let's like have you read an entire book yeah, and then have a discussion around the book. Yes. And so we understand like not everything, even if you do it, you still mm -hmm. don't get it super quickly. Let's make sure like maybe it's take you two months to get that. Yeah. Worth it. Yeah. All right. I Come love, on. I love that. What, it, what's your, your big, uh, your big goal with your, with your business besides the personal goals? Like what do you, what is the big picture for you? What are you trying to do? Um, with what you're doing with the fitness space? Yeah, I mean, the goal has remained the same. So ever since 2012, I've, every six months, I make a big list of goals. Uh, and I always have like the the number one goal at the top. Like what's like the, you could call it the mission statement. I never call it a mission statement. Like what's like the main goal? And ever since 2012, it's just help as many people as possible. Um, there have been different types of goals, whether it's like number of people in the membership or like number of downloads or whatever it was. But the number one goal has always just been like help as many people as possible. And so that's the, for me, been that that's the main goal. Um, so building the inner circle, continue to build the online fitness business mentorship. And then I'm, I'm just about to, I'm embarking on a new fitness or business where I'm actually creating something for jujitsu competitors or jujitsu athletes. Um, because it's that space is very far behind in strength and conditioning yeah. forever that the, the martial arts world, especially the jujitsu world has been based on, you don't need strength. It's just technique and technique is the most important, but you have two people of equal technique. The stronger one of wins course. every time. So the, that world in strength and conditioning is probably behind by 20 years. And so I'm, I'm in the process of making something for jujitsu competitors right now. What are, what are some, uh, <clears throat> important, um, strength training uh, parameters or techniques or exercises or movements that you see being uh, valuable to jiu-jitsu or grapplers in general? The There's a lot, but I would say isometric ability, isometric strength is just like, it's it's the most overlooked uh, from the perspective of, have you ever trained jiu-jitsu? Have you done it? Uh, I did. I did for about six years. Oh, you your purple belt, right? Time, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, dude, just got my purple belt like six oh, months ago. Thank you. Yeah. It's like the, the thing for me that was very surprising is, um, and I wrestled, but wrestling, especially there's no gi. Yeah. So it's so much more explosive it's more, and more quick. Explosive. Whereas jujitsu, especially in the gi is like, it's more time under tension. Mm -hmm. You're holding on. Uh, you need more control inherently in order to get the submission. So it takes more time and isometric contraction. So even something as like, I would have someone in an arm bar, but like one of the main keys of an arm bar is squeezing your legs together. Yeah. It's like, if you don't have your legs squeezed together, then they can move. Their shoulder is more open to be able to like, yeah. uh, rotate so that it's not necessarily going to break their elbow so it's like sometimes you got to squeeze your legs together for like 30 seconds straight or like if you're holding someone down you got to hold them it's like you're using your biceps you're using your back you're using your lats and like if you gas out if you don't have the isometric strength then like you're done so I, I think the ability to uh create force sustained over a long period of time isometrically or slowly eccentrically is super important so whether that's like simple med ball squeezes. I like doing inverted rows, but like we'll do like a set of 10 followed by like a max effort. How long can you hold in that isometric position at the top? Um, I do actually, like, uh, I'll do, if I'm doing hamstring curls, I'll, I'll put like a med ball or a foam roller in, be in between my legs to get the isometric mm -hmm. contraction with the adductors while I'm doing the hamstring curl. So the, the isometric work I think is something that is, is super helpful for performance. Have you looked into, cause we just wrote a program, um, and it was based off of the bronze era Okay. Of strength training. Yeah. And they were isometric 
chant. Like they, they isometrics was a big part of strength training. Yeah. Um, and there's great studies from the Soviet Union on the, yeah. the benefits of isometrics. I mean, it, it builds in a short period of time more strength than any other form of exercise. Huge. Um, so have you looked into some of those practices? Because, I, I mean, there's some stuff that we learned that I looked at. I'm like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. Yeah, it's like what specifically? Oh, like overhead carries, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, offset loaded, yes. you know, positions and that kind of stuff. Um, your, their hands were involved in almost everything they did because they didn't even have a bench back then. It was yes. barbell and dumbbells and... I and love the mace it. work. I love the club work, Bulgarian bag work. Like I like that stuff a lot. Yeah. That for me, that's, I've never been a bodybuilding guy, as you can see. Like I'm not like a, a big dude. I've, that has never been fun for me. I started wrestling when I was eight years old. So kettlebells, maces, clubs, Bulgarian bags. I, I love that yeah. stuff. I love the movement. I love the explosion. I love like, for me, I think one of, I think the best exercises for a jujitsu athlete is a kettlebell snatch. Yeah. Or, or really like any type of kettlebell circuit, but a kettlebell snatch, it's very difficult to train explosiveness and endurance and grip all at once. And with jujitsu, especially sometimes you're grabbing on really tight and sometimes you're loose, tight, loose, tight, loose. Mm -hmm. And the kettlebell snatch, you have to learn, all right, well, I'm going to be loose throughout this and I'm going to be tight and I'm going to hold on to it, make sure it doesn't fly out of my hands. Like it's the kettlebell snatch is one of those things where you could just go for five minutes straight. And it's, I think it's one of the best exercises mm -hmm. you can do. And so overhead work for sure. But all these different, these, uh, I think Dan John calls them armor building. Uh, it's, it's so smart. And that for me is where I have the most fun. You know, I think. you know what I did is I took, um, an old gi yeah. and I cut the sleeves off and I create, I, I would wrap them around. So I do all my pulling work yeah. with, with gi sleeves. Yeah. That made a huge that difference. Your fingers got so strong. From they that. got really yeah. strong from doing. I mean, you look at old jujitsu <laughs> fighters, and you see their fingers are like their knuckles are. Yeah, because <laughs> they developed just crazy grip strength. But that made a big difference. Pull ups that. like that, rows like that, holding anything like that. Yeah, a big difference. Yeah. Sure. Jordan, I want to get into um, a little more detail about your business because I don't know if you've heard me say this. Uh, I've definitely said it many times. If I didn't have these three other brilliant guys with me, and I had to build this business by myself, and mm -hmm. I had to start all over that I would probably build it similar to how you've structured mm. your business. And so for the coaches and trainers that are listening to this podcast, I'd like to, if you feel comfortable with yeah. doing a little bit deeper dive, like I'd love to know like um, what has been the most profitable for you, um, not just financially, but also like uh, takes the least time and effort maybe with mm -hmm. the most return for you. What are maybe some things that you've done or still do that actually like you thought were going to be very profitable that weren't very profitable? Like oh, talk yeah. a little bit about how your business is structured right yeah. now and what is most profitable for you and maybe some of the mistakes that you made building it. Yeah. I mean, I'll, so I'll, whatever you want to know, I will tell you full, like forthright, a hundred percent. Okay. Um, I will say at the very beginning, what I do now is not what I would recommend for most people. Okay. And, and I, and a large part of it is based on my audience size. And I think a, like what I have now is the, the main thing is my membership, the inner circle membership. I think a lot of people want that. Number one, they think it's relatively easy and they're like, oh, it's scalable. It's like good fucking luck. If you think this is easy, like, it's a ton of work. Mm -hmm. It's also has an inherently higher churn rate. Uh, and people think, oh, well, if I could do a lower cost thing, then I'm going to get more people signing up. It's like, that's a, it's a stupid way to look at it. It's just, if someone was, if someone was on the street selling, I don't know, Pokemon cards and you don't like Pokemon cards, it doesn't matter if that Pokemon card is 10 cents or $10 or a hundred dollars. You're not going to buy it anyway. Cause you don't fucking like it. Mm -hmm. The hardest part is just getting someone to like pay for it, period. So early on from 2011 to 2015, it was just one-on-one -on -one online coaching. That was it. I didn't have a membership. It was, and at that point, it was between three hundred to four hundred dollars a month. And I could I, at the peak, and this was way too much, was about eighty clients online. And and that was when I was like, I need to start something more scalable because I have I can't give eighty people a great service. Right. Uh, it's taking up sixteen hours a day of email. It, so I, that's when I was like, all right, now I'm going to start making something scalable. That's when I decided to make the inner circle. But. I think from a, a income perspective and a work-life balance perspective and not needing a large audience perspective, you can easily have 30 to 50 one-on-one -on -one online coaching clients make an incredible living and also have amazing work-life balance. Yeah. I think that like it, that that amount of clientele, you don't need a huge audience. You, if you have a couple hundred Instagram followers, you have a couple hundred people listening, like you could easily do that for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So I think from ease of access, actually working with real people and creating a sustainable business that supports you, your family and helps people. I think one-on-one -on -one coaching is, is the best option. 
if you build a larger audience and if you, and, and that takes a lot of work. Yeah. It takes a lot of work to In build time. a bigger audience. Like yeah. m- more than people realize, more than people have it. Even if you, there are people, especially the way the algorithm works now where you can go viral and have like a big audience with one video, but it doesn't mean you have their attention all the time. Right. So if you have a large audience of people who are really invested in you, then the idea of scaling something can make sense. But I would, I would start like it goes in-person coaching, number one, then one-on-one online coaching. Then if you decide and you have the ability, then you can have something more scalable, which is what I have now. But I think the vast majority of people would be better off just doing one-on-one online coaching with maybe with a mix of in-person coaching as well. A little bit of a hybrid. Do you think that that has a lot to do with like, cause we get asked a lot why we didn't do an app or have this monthly thing. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons why, I mean, I, I hate that model because I think it's the commitment yes. to having to be, cause the turn, the turn rate is so high yep. and it commits you to having to constantly be every month, every month, creating more and more content are way to convince those yeah. people to keep paying that monthly every subscription. Month. And yet I think that's the go-to model that so many coaches mm-hmm. and trainers yeah. think. So looking back, do you think that, uh, do you think you priced yourself too low in that? Or do you think that like, cause here's where I work, where I'm going, like in, inevitably, I would want to scale beyond just the private. Like, if you just wanted to make a, a good living, like you said, you could be totally good. Like, I if I have aspirations of being a multi millionaire, I want yeah. to scale and go Correct. bigger. Obviously, yes. that's you got to go beyond that. So, I uh, let's say that's what if you were to go over do it again, you know, you're going to go on that trajectory again, you're going to outgrow mm-hmm. coaching, you have 80 clients. What are some steps that you would have probably done different knowing what you know now? Uh, still going for, for like trying to have a bigger bit. Yeah. Bigger, yeah. You're, you've outgrown, you got 80 clients, you're, yeah. you're on your way to making more money. You're getting so, bigger. Like what, what would you have done differently about the way you went? Yeah. So this is, and this is advice I got from Eric Cresty when I was younger and I didn't listen to it mm. is I wouldn't have put my name on the business. Ah, I wouldn't have had my name on it. It wouldn't be my face. Uh, yeah, it's hard to give, it's hard to have someone else help you. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. It's very Everybody difficult. wants you. Everyone wants me. I'm the one. It's like when they get an email, it's like, but what does Jordan say? Or like when, like even on social media, I think there's so one thing that you guys do very well. And we spoke about is you, you build other people up. And I think you could have a business that builds other coaches up. That is more of a community as opposed to necessarily being your name. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to get into like making money that I, that I haven't made, but I've seen people do is like, it's building these businesses, having equity in these businesses, and then being able to sell them off, something like sure. that. Uh, and I see this with apps. And, and that's actually, f- to be candid and forthright, this jujitsu app will not have my name and will not have my face. It has nothing to do with me. So when I first launch it, obviously I'll use my current audience uh, to to launch towards it so they'll know it's me. But within like two to five years, I would love it if no one knew that I was the one behind it. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. that's so that's the direction I'm going with that where it's like it's not my name, not my face. It's I just want to have really great um workouts and nutrition advice if I can get other strength coaches involved, other jiu-jitsu competitors involved, amazing, but it will not be my name and face. You know where so, I learned that? When I was uh 23, 22 is when I got promoted to become a fitness manager. So I was a trainer from 20 to 21 and a half or 22 range. So for a year, two years. And then at that time, you're just figuring it out and you're selling people on personal training with you. Then I get promoted to be a fitness manager where now I'm responsible for 15 trainers underneath me. Uh, I still am selling personal training, but now my trainers are going to, train. and I had such a difficult time mm-hmm. that first like year of, you know, I, I was so good at like presenting myself and then people would be like, okay, well, when do we start? And be like, oh no, well, Jordan's going to take right. you. And they'd be like, <laughs> oh, well, no, well then I don't want to buy. And right. they'd be like, oh fuck, what do I do? Right. So I, that was a real hard transition. Once I figured out that I would sell the program, sell everything else that we do, or already be talking about how great these my, the trainer that that's going to take them is, they're better than I am. Like that, that took a, a skill to be able to do that. I learned that in my early twenties. So and so did these guys. So I knew when we built this, even when we had nobody even paying attention to us, we had the foresight to go like, hey, like at one point 
we do a good job, we will be yeah. at that transition when we know like we want to be able to hand the keys over to somebody else to be able to carry it on. If we've done a good job of selling the philosophy or the programming and so that and it's not us. Yes. But I had to go through that. That's why we didn't so. name it the Adam podcast. But we wanted, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wanted he was really first. pushing for it. Yeah. <laughs> We've done really well at the gate sell that way. Yeah, so okay, so you, okay, we make uh you 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 learn that part, your your inner circle. Is the inner circle the most profitable part yes, for you? By far. Okay. Yeah, by far. And then have you uh, like are you take did you take on any sponsors or partnerships? Never. Like so you don't? No, never. So, so talk why and would you do that differently? Like <sighs> No, I wouldn't do that differently. Okay. Um not so the thing is, and I, it's not that I think it's bad for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's just for me, I never wanted my income to be in the hands of someone else. So for example, if I say something that a sponsor doesn't like, I don't want them to pull, pull funding. Yeah. Like I never wanted to be like, oh, okay, so well, I don't want to not say this because they're going to be upset to about it ever. It's like, yeah. for me, the number one thing is just, I have to say what I believe to be true. And so I felt like if I started doing sponsors, number one, inherently I would become more biased. Like there's sort of no way around it. Like there, you have that financial incentive, even if you're like, no, but I'm going to tell the truth. It's like, it's, you have that in the back of your head. I didn't want that. I didn't want the hesitation. I didn't want the thought. It's like, I only want people to pay me because I have something that they can be, that can be helpful to them. So that was really it. I was like, if I do sponsors, I'm setting myself up for potential issues. Down Jordan, the road. can I, can I, can I, can I add something to that? <laughs> you yeah. love how we did it. Okay. So yeah. So you're right. A hundred percent. That's what, that was our fear with working with sponsors, but e here's what we learned. Well, we learned this a long time ago. We brought this into the business because we did other things before is uh, if we show them the numbers, we could say whatever we want. Mm. And so we've literally had sponsors email us and go, um, Adam said our product tastes like shit on yeah. the podcast. Yeah, he literally did. But like, but Sal said it's effective. Yeah. And then they'd say, but you can't say that. And we'd say, look at your numbers. And then they'd be like, mm -hmm. never mind. Yeah. Or you guys are selling a lot of products. Or we say, or we say you can't work with us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, like, yeah. we waited early. So early that. on, we, we denied sponsorship because early on, some people looked at us to take advantage of the platform we had built and we weren't interested in that. Yeah. So we waited, 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 waited until it got to a point where it's like, well, listen, there's products and things that we all like and use. Like, let's go pursue them. So we would pursue companies mm. that we already love products yeah. or things they use and said, hey, here's the deal. We have this audience, we do this. And a lot of times I had to offer sponsorships and I would just like you would with training clients for free or low. I'd say, mm -hmm. listen, let us show you. Hey, if we talk about it, you'll see the results from it. And that's how we would present it. We were going to talk about the products anyways. We like them, we use it. They would see the huge numbers from it. Then they'd come back and be like, okay, let's do something. Then when we sign the contract, it'd be like, well, here's the deal. We're not going to do reads. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about it the way we want to talk about it. There's no length on how we're going to talk about it. Like, And we're going to be honest about how we feel about it. And- we want nothing affiliate related, meaning I don't want any ties to the performance yes. to yeah. our deal. Here's yeah. the contract. You pay us this much. Yep. That's the flat. I don't care if it goes up or down or what like that. It's like, cause we do not, I don't want to be motivated by performance. I don't want to feel like, oh, we're underperforming. So we got to really yeah. sell it on Smart. the next episode. And so we just, and it, it took longer to do it that way. We didn't make a lot of money at first. But eventually it did. Eventually we found all the partners we want to work with, the performance. You, you know did what really it is? Well, and then I so. Mean, the irony is uh, the health and fitness space has been lying for so long. Yeah. That when you're honest, people trust you and then they follow your advice. Right. So yeah. when we say, well, you know, this is a, it's a, you know, it actually works, but it tastes like crap. People are like, oh, well, he's being honest. Right, right. Because we are. Yes. And they end up buying. And we'll still, and I'll still talk about something even if we're not paid for it. It's just like, hey, I use this product. They don't pay us. Hey, we talk about you all the time. You yeah. don't pay us. Yeah. 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 Is that, is that a, a major part of the the business, the the advertising? Is like, does that contribute a lot? It yeah. is significant now, but yeah. it's now, not the yeah. majority. Yeah. Got it. it. it okay. caught up. But yeah. yeah. It was yeah. originally. Yeah. yeah. The, the MAPS programs has always been a bulk of the, the revenue. It's what built the business, but all the bolt-ons now. And, that, and that's, closest so that of all the revenue streams uh advertising and sponsorship is is second oh know? is it and oh maps yeah. is number one yeah. yeah got it yeah that's awesome so it's that's amazing. And, and it's uh and what is best about that actually the, what i think i appreciate the most is here we are going into or we're not even there yet but next year before this year is over advertising for the entire year will be paid Wow. So talk about the relief and stress mm -hmm. and pressure yeah. of running a team right, and right. pay bills. Like 
that and the amount of money that covers all everything. Wow. So that's all huge. overhead, all expenses, everything is all completely covered from the sponsorship side. So we know going into the next year that like I'm not so if the business is going up or down or programs aren't selling yeah. as much, there's no stress because we have that base from our our partnership. So as long as we get on this these mics and communicate and talk, the business will stay afloat and there's that less pressure. So that's probably the part I think I appreciate the most. Yeah. Is having that security for the people. I mean, I think the most stressful thing for us now is just like the amount of employees and stuff that we have. Like, I mean, they probably don't realize it, but how much that's what keeps me up at night yeah. of the, you know, ebb and flow of the, of yeah. the business. How many employees do you guys have? What are we up to like 20 or so? Yeah. Give wow. or take that yeah, are, that's scary. that are full-time employees. And then a lot of contractors um, that are working for us too. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So you, as a, as a leader in the space um, and we consider you definitely one of the, one of the leaders in the space, what would you say are the biggest roadblocks for us um, to really make an impact to help people figure this out? Like what are the biggest right now? What do you think are the biggest struggles that were or, or, or challenges that we have to overcome for, for like people with an audience or people who are yeah. making content? Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think misinformation yeah. is the biggest one. I mean, I just, every day I'm sent posts like, but this person says this, this, and like they're a doctor and they have this. It's like, it's the misinformation is, is I think the the biggest one. I also think that like we spoke about is the cultural lifestyle that people are having, like overcoming that. And like you said earlier, mental health is at an all time low. Isn't that crazy? It, at all time low. And like after everything we've been through over the last few years, it's like the least surprising thing. It's like, it's, it's crazy, but it's, I'm not surprised, you know? Um, and I think when mental health, is at an all time low, it gets increasingly more difficult to get people to believe in themselves, to make them believe that it's worth it, that they can actually accomplish it. And I think so many people are just stuck in a place of like, I don't think I can do it. I don't think it's worth it. Like I, I I'm stuck. I can't do it. And so not only are we fighting misinformation, not only are we fighting like a cultural lifestyle, but we're also fighting their own demons in their head being like, I don't think I can do it. And we've got to, you absolutely can. Like one of my favorite conversations around individual responsibility, but it's very difficult for people to feel like they can take responsibility if they don't feel like they can do anything at all. If they feel disempowered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think the one thing that the fitness space communicates uh, that sh they should communicate better that we don't enough focus. And I understand why the market values uh, how you look. They, they, they value, you know, when you lose weight, what you look like and how great you look, but we do not communicate the mental health benefits of fitness at all yeah, well enough correct and the data is clear however much of a positive impact fitness makes on your physical health it's actually more impactful on your mental health yeah it's the most impactful thing you can do for anxiety mm -hmm. depression mm -hmm. um uh, you know any type of negative mental state nothing shows the positive impact that fitness shows in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then in a long period of time, there's no um, loss of effects or down regulation of receptors, or I need to use a new medication. It keeps working better mm -hmm. for your mental health. We don't talk about this enough. At all. And it's the story that comes to my mind is when I was, I think I, I must've been 21. I was coaching at a gym and I would, one of the reasons I would love having people deadlift is because whenever I told them how much weight they lifted, they would freak out. And, and I'll never forget. There was one woman who came in and, and she had a lot of weight to lose and she was very self-conscious and, and it was her first session. And when we were going to be deadlifting, I, I told her, I was like, how much do you think you can lift? She was like, oh, I don't know, like 20 pounds. I was like, by the end of today, you're going to lift over a hundred pounds. And she was like, no, she's like, absolutely not. There's no way. And so we had like that, the beast kettlebell, like we had a big, big, big kettlebells. And so she wasn't lifting the barbell. It looked really intimidating to her. And at the end of it, like she had deadlifted over a hundred pounds. I didn't tell her how much weight it was. I was like, right. all right, just lift this one, just lift this one. Yeah. All right, cool. Now lift this one. And she put it down. I was like, guess how much weight that was? And, and she was like, I was like, 105. She started crying. Oh. Yeah. It wasn't because the physical, there were, like the physical benefit was like, oh my God, now she's so much physically healthier. Right. She was crying. The mental, like the, the confidence, she made a Facebook post when she got home. Oh yeah. my God, this has improved like one day and she lifted over a hundred mm -hmm. pounds. It's like, 
that is the type of mental health benefits that we see that 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 will make her more consistent for years to come because of that confidence that came from it. There's no, she was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. Well, now she believes in herself. And so they, th- these are the mental health benefits that people can get. And that starts with things like that. Jordan, when yep. you were you were talking earlier and you mentioned this on the podcast too, that, you know, school didn't come easy to you. You, you, you were in some special ed classes because of ADD and attention issues and that kind of stuff. And that was very challenging to you, especially coming from, an academic family. Mm-hmm. Um, if you didn't have fitness, wh- where do you think you'd be Bro, with all that? I think about that all the time. I, f- I have no idea, and it wouldn't be good. That is for sure. Um, I I wouldn't be able to function in a cubicle. I don't think I'd be able to function in an office. Um, I was never good with taking orders from people. Like you have to do this. Like I was like I was I was not good with that. And. I was never really good with numbers. I was never good with organization, any of that. So I don't know where I would be, but it would be bad. I very much believe it because I I don't think I'd be able to function in what we consider normal today, a normal job, a usual job, what people would call a safe job. I don't think I would be able to function in that. Um, So I know that after high school, when I went to Israel, I was very close to joining the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, it was something that I wanted to do. And the only reason I didn't, I didn't is because my mom said she'd fucking kill me. <laughs> so, uh, but like could have been a military background. Like I, I very much wanted to join the IDF and that's something in the future I'd like to do is I would like to be able to provide military with, with good strength and conditioning for free. That'd be something that I'd love to do in the future. But without fitness, I, I have, I have no idea, no mm. clue, but it wouldn't be good. What were the, what are the, some of the benefits you got through fitness that have nothing to do with your physical body? Mm, I mean, the community around it has been amazing. And I, and this is something I've been talking a lot about. Um, and it, obviously like not watching the news, but the other thing is community and people will t- talk to me all the time about like, what can I do for my health? I'm like, go hang out with real people <laughs> in real life. And so that's like, even now, like I always try and like, I'll coach people for free in person sometimes. And like, it's one of the reasons I love jujitsu is like, you have to do it in person. You have mm-hmm. to, hang, and then you can go out after jujitsu and you go get some, get a beer or whatever it is, like hang out, go on a walk. But I, I think the community for me has been the most amazing part. Yeah. It's just like connecting with people, speaking with people, people who have differing views on so many different things, but it's like, we're together. We're I mean, that out. was the, in the blue zone. That's the number one thing that's in common. Oh, yeah. The most common thing amongst community. all the blue zones is the, is the community aspect. Yeah, totally. You yeah. know, what's so frustrating for me recently is I keep seeing these articles talking about, um, how, um, the toxicity of gyms, uh, how gyms are not welcoming or yeah. inclusive, how they fat shame for those of us who've been working out for years. It's, it's so frustrating to read that because let me ask you, can you name a more inclusive place than a hardcore gym? No, it's like the nicest, yeah. most incredible, like encouraging. If you if if you want to see like one of the most amazing experience, go to a powerlifting competition. Yeah, and watch everybody cheering, like even yeah. people competing against each other. You've got this! Like everyone's yelling, like you got you can do this. Like people mm-hmm. who've never been to a competition before, teaching them how to warm up properly. It's the most amazing place. I think people look at them and they actually end up judging them based on how they look. They're big. They have they have beards. They're tattooed. They're yeah. judging me. It's like you're judging them based on how they look. Like, I bet if like, if you got close to them, they'd be, Hey, let me help you with this. Let me help you with that. It's like the most encouraging, most supportive community, these hardcore gyms, like the, the power, like when someone walks in, they're like, yes, another one, another one. Like, exactly. we got them. like yeah. let's, let's help. Like it's the nicest place ever. I know. I, exactly. f- I actually even felt that in the, in the bodybuilding world, which I would have never thought. Cause the that's such, one, yeah, because it's a superficial type of world. You are judged on the way you look, but I was surprised by the, how accepting, welcoming and supportive that community was. I remember being backstage, not knowing anybody. And, you know, everybody, I think it has something to do with, we all know what the other person went through, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. there's like this, this, we all respect the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like if you got there, I don't care if you were the the worst physique at everybody, or you were the weakest person on that stage that day, you know, that that person, what they went through just to get to that point. Yes. And there's something about that. You want to support that and encourage that. There's not this like putting down or like laughing at or pointing. You don't get any of that at all. It's like. I think I really enjoyed, that was one of my favorite things of the the few things I think I really liked about bodybuilding was I did like that, you know, there was that community feel, even in a sport where you're competing. Oh, I'll tell you something right now. If you go to, if you're listening right now and you go to a hardcore gym, uh, do not ridicule anybody and act like you will get kicked out faster Yeah. than you can, you can even realize yeah. because that's the environment that you're in. So when I read those articles, I just go, God, this is terrible. It's not even, 
slightly true. It's no. so opposite of, uh, and again, I can't, I have a friend, he's a, he's a priest and he lifts weights, right? He's Father Steve, great guy. And him and I have talked about this and he goes, you know, the church should learn a lot from gyms. He goes, I, the gym is the most inclusive place I've ever been. Yeah. Like you go in and j- if you're working out, they love you and they're yeah. supporting you. And that's that. Yeah, it's you amazing. clean up your equipment. You don't stand in front of the dumbbell rack when you're doing like, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's like yeah, you're yeah, fine. Exactly. Like everyone loves you. <laughs> I know. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, Jordan, it's always fun talking to you, bro. Likewise. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, thank you all so much. Like for you, for the whole team, for everyone, it's uh it's always a pleasure coming out and um I really appreciate you guys. I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate what you do for the space. So thank you for having me out. Yeah, well, you keep doing what you're doing, man. You're you're, you're doing a damn good job. And uh, I hope you create more people like you because we could use it for sure. (laughs) Thank you very much. Appreciate you, man. You got it, brother.